I mean, Mohammed's conviction is that there was a conspiracy. I mean, he has a, a whole history of, um, you know, knowing Diana and her family. Uh, Diana had confided in him that, uh, you know, she feared for her life and this sort of thing. Um, I mean, he believes firmly still that there was a conspiracy. He hasn't had access to the British intelligence files. We haven't had answers, uh, you know, to who was driving the Fiat Uno, why Henri Paul had carbon monoxide in his blood, ridiculous amount that he wouldn't have been able to walk if he hadn't, so on. There are all these unanswered questions. Mohammed is a grieving father who wants the answers. He has the uh, resources and the will to get them. This is Bristol. It's Friday. It's <clears throat> minutes past five. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, a lot of rearranging in the studio to do here. And uh, it's welcome to Not the BCFM Politics Show uh, on the 8th of March 2024, streaming live from the People's Republic of Stokescroft Arts Centre in Bristol on the talkradio.org.uk stream and on radioquk.com in Camberley, Surrey. Also live on the Not the BCFM Politics Show app. Available free from all good app stores. Please don't use the Google Play Store. Use Aurora. In fact, you can, if you've got an Android phone, you can install Aurora and get all the original apps rather than the ones that Google filters in the Play Store. So, I'm Tony Gosling. Thank you for turning off the psycho in the corner, gaslighting us with its propaganda psyops, the puff pieces on the conspirators and the hatchet jobs on the heroes. Uh, not just here in Bristol and Britain, but around the world. Uh, so, uh, what we'll be doing today is uh, the looking at uh, all sorts of, well, particularly navigating the World Economic Forum's Fourth Industrial Revolution and the Fourth Reich Matrix. Who knows where we're going to head tonight? Um, but joining me in the studio is Irish Republican Labour activist Martin Summers. I've also got freelance journalist uh, from Bristol, Joe Banks, and um, Green Councillor in Bristol for Central Ward, Annie Stafford Townsend. So, uh, as it's uh, International Women's Day, you're you're actually popping off, Annie, aren't you? After we finish, mm. to do something in t- the city centre about this. Yeah, there's a, a Women for Palestine. There's a Women for Palestine march at um, Castle Park from six. So I'm going to go along to that. Well, that's a, a bit of an anti-Semitic statement. Women for Palestine. Now, I know it's a very mean thing to say, but people have been saying the same about me. What, what do you make of the Palestine, whole Palestine Gaza business? I think that uh, there's innocent civilians being hurt in, and caught up in this, and that's why we need an immediate ceasefire. Well, 30,000 killed. Uh, never, yeah, mind, exactly. never mind just hurt. Mm. We do need an immediate ceasefire. Why do you think there hasn't been one? And do you think the Brits are in any position to push for one? I mean, what's the point of us saying it? I think uh, the UK has got a very strong place on the international stage and therefore the things that we call for has a huge amount of power. So, yes, it is what we should be calling for. And why aren't we? Um, I mean, I'm... You have to ask Rishi Sunak that, but um, I mean, Green Party policy is, and the Green Party have been very clear right from the offset, right from the when it first happened in October, have been calling for a ceasefire right from the beginning. So we've always been really clear on that stance. Well, it's it? good to get that out of the way. With I've been accused by uh, the campaign against anti-Semitism this week of being an anti-Semite. Mm-hmm. Um, I just ignore these things nowadays. I don't think there's any point in suing these people, because in a way, I had several messages on different systems saying, this is a badge of honour, Tony. Uh, but, of course, I'm not anti-Semitic. I just make a big difference between the state of Israel and the Jewish faith, the Jewish religion and the people who were persecuted in World War II are not the same people now running Israel by any means. So uh, w- let's just talk a bit about Bristol politics. Mm-hmm. Now we've got off the world stage uh, because your party's looking, actually looking set to take the city over p- potentially in May. What do you think your chances are? I think our, our chances are looking quite good and I think yeah, the, the city of Bristol and people here are looking for something different. We've had a predominantly Labour led administration for the last four decades it would be quite good for bristol to have something different and i think now is the time for the greens to demonstrate how we could do things differently and how it doesn't need to be like it is it could hopefully be something different something more well, positive. i think everyone wants different when they mm-hmm. go to the ballot box don't they but uh, what, what indications are you that the greens might win in may uh well, i've got our uh, Data. We've got the fact that we are the largest group on council at the moment. Um, obviously, under a mayoral model, we aren't the party of opposition of, of administration. We are the party of opposition instead. And even in our position as opposition, we've still managed to get some positive changes through the council. 
um, and you know, we were highly so a committee system which is what we're switching to in May is Green Party policy that's what we advocated for and that's what we got our uh, administration administrative model switched to actually it was well. the Lib Dems was the old the old council leader well I shouldn't call her the old council it sounds mean uh, but she was a f- previous council leader Barbara mm. Jank uh, in the House of Lords that actually uh, got the law changed to allow for the referendum the Lib Dems really pushed for this but it seems like you're the ones to benefit from it. Well, we worked collaboratively with them, which is what we need to do under a committee system with all other parties. Um, the Lib Dems favoured a uh, leader and cabinet model, which is what they had previously. Green Party policy is for a committee working uh, model, which is what we advocated for, and that's what we got as part of our sort of pushing the Lib Dems to advocate eventually for a committee model rather than a um, leader and cabinet because a leader and cabinet is really no different than a mayor model and so by sort of scrapping the mayor and going for a leader and cabinet it'll be frying pan fire so that's why we advocated for a committee system it's why Green Party policy advocates for committee systems because it's a much more inclusive way of um, representing politics in a city well, because it's a very diverse city and it isn't represented by any one party and it never can be and we need that plurality of view being represented within the administration and the way in which you run the council in order to make sure that it is a city for everybody, not just the viewpoint of one particular party. Okay, so the Lib Dems uh, started the process, but you put your weight in behind it, is that fair? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, right. So uh, when it comes to uh, policies, we we covered your, um, over the Christmas period, uh, and there was a a a debacle in um, one of the, uh, development control committee meetings mm-hmm. and then there was also following that uh, a full council meeting i was absolutely shocked to hear both the mayor and the i think he was the uh, housing guy or the planning tom renard thank you <laughs> so thanks joe <laughs> chipping in um the, actually discussing a complaint against you in full council now I mean, anyone that's ever been involved in running any kind of big organisation, council, business, I mean, as I was in a housing association, you you just simply understand that once a complaint is started, it's a confidential process. I was shocked to hear the mayor and the um, and uh, Tom Renard both in the full council meeting discussing details of your complaint. Uh, so this does suggest that there's a bit of a deficit in governance. Can you say something about what you think about the way that the council is being run in terms of governance? Because I think there's a lot of people around the city who are scratching their heads looking at this stuff say do these people really know what they're doing yeah so it was i mean that was quite a unfortunate whole series of events uh, so tom Renard is a leader of the labor group and their pick for leader post may um what happened was a member of the public said something that was misheard after a planning committee meeting was misheard by a councillor she placed a complaint about that but it got it only came in through the council processes after the Labour group, Labour group posted about it on Twitter, calling for my resignation. And then it got um, repeated in full council. The thing is, that in the system, that a complaint, um, in a complaint system, that you a member puts in a complaint and it stays confidential. Now, if that had happened, if the member had put a complaint in and it remained confidential, then when the, the evidence of what had actually happened, uh, which corrected the mishearing that the member had, then that would have all been solved quickly, gently, behind closed doors. All those misunderstandings could have been smoothed out. Everybody would have not been upset. The member of the public would have not been horrendously upset, and she still is. All of it. Would have been done, dusted before Christmas. It would have all been fine. But by making a political uh, hoo ha about it, it's been blown up into something much more harmful than it needed to be. And it's a, bit, a complete uh, mockery of the complaint system as well because it goes against everything. Well, in you the know what system. I was thinking at the time. I was thinking if I were you, I'd be making a complaint against Marley Bennett and against the mayor for 
talking about something confidential in a full council meeting. But of course, I don't imagine I couldn't you possibly did that. comment on that. No, but you didn't. You didn't do that. But you see, this is the problem, isn't it? You, you often find uh, that the people who just want to get on and do stuff don't make these little niggling complaints. And uh, but anyway, what do you think about generally about about governance and about the competence of the current team? I think generally there is a conception or an understanding that complaints have never been upheld by the monitoring officer who is the person who investigates all complaints um i mean the complaint against me wasn't upheld uh, that has been dismissed as politically motivated but i also know that complaints have been upheld towards councillors in the past as well even though well i was told complaints never upheld it feels like it's a little bit of a way of dissuading people from making complaints because there's no point because you're gonna it's not gonna be upheld well, I mean, anyway. i've heard this from police officers that say well we made a complaint against x officer and then uh, we were we were ourselves were targeted uh, i mean it's obviously it's a very important mm. um uh, i mean i mean it, it may be a more extreme version martin but we've been hearing this week about uh, northern ireland and steak knife and frank scapatici who was the if you want complaints officer for the ira although he was extremely you know this meant uh, people would be executed uh, and the fact was that he was actually working for the other side so this is a extremely uh, it's extremely important to get this right, is what I'm trying mm. to say. And it's also really important to uh, that kind of concept in law of not you know, innocent until proven guilty. And that has to also be part of a complaint system. It has to be confidential at the beginning part in order for proper investigations to take place. And then if somebody is found to be um, factual and the complaint is upheld, that's the point then potentially the result of it could be made public and the ramifications of that whichever obviously depending on the complaint but you know the way in which the person at fault is directed to make things better that could be public but if it's found to have not been upheld found to be politically motivated but you know and just to be dismissed then it should remain confidential because that's very damaging to people and it also completely removes any faith that people have in in a complaint system because then people can use a complaint system as a weapon against each other particularly in the political sphere and in, in other organizations as well where you get kind of lots of, sort of politics behind closed doors as well uh the other issue at the moment which I've, i was amazed to see that one of the last things that this administration is doing assuming it doesn't get back in in may mm -hmm. is the massive hikes to allotment rents now what do the greens make of that and what are you going to do if you take over in may well we stood side by side with the allotment holders and supported them through that process uh martin fodor who's our chair of scrutiny for community scrutiny made sure that we got uh, the allotments on the scrutiny for communities so we got to look at it ask some questions look at it a bit more detail got them to wheel back on some of those things they've still pushed through the, the hikes um and it like with a lot of the different issues that have kind of suddenly been pushed through in this last year it's a uh, something that they were so underfunding their own uh, allotment service but they only did something about it in the last year of their administration why didn't they do it years ago why have they waited until the last couple of like the dying days of this administration to push it through the same with a whole range of other things i'm sure you're probably going to ask me about in a minute as well but there's a lot of things that have suddenly started happening now that they've been trying to keep off or they've just slipped through at the very last minute and Goodness only knows what they're going to... There's going to be waiting for whoever is the new administration Can in May. we say maybe that there's lots of little creatures creeping out from under the carpet that they've been sweeping under for the last few years? There's massive crocodiles under the carpet. <laughs> okay. you know? Anyway, let's have a listen now to Cabinet this week, mm -hmm. uh, where we had some discussion about the... Um, about this whole business of uh, upping the allotment fees uh, and some pretty shocking figures as well. Uh, I think uh, we can hear now this is on tuesday this week discussion about allotments with the mayor we can hear a bit of him as well here tessa price this is a joint statement written together by 14 community projects and groups based on allotment sites across the city far from bringing new opportunities for collective food growing these rent rises will be really damaging for our projects and they risk closing some of us down. Partly, we, some of us may be financially not viable anymore. We simply can't cover our costs. Some of us um, will have a huge amount of extra admin work created by the discount scheme that won't be manageable for us. 
Collectively, our projects bring huge benefits to the people of Bristol, giving, offering a sense of community, mental and physical health benefits, connection with our food and with land. I think we probably also save the council collectively huge amounts of money across other areas, things like the reduced need for SEND provision, the reduced need for mental health support and drug and alcohol support, um, probably dwarfing the increased income that's going to be created by these rent rises. Most of us, most of our projects don't take a penny in funding from the council. We really don't ask for much help from the council. All we're asking is that you don't wreck what we're doing by forcing through these ill-considered proposals. Please, please don't put through these rent rises. They are going to do so much harm to our projects. Yeah, I mean, and I, 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 please ask the... I will not go... If we want to shout out, I'll just stop, and we'll use that for 15 minutes. I think the point I make is if we want to enter into a discussion and the gentleman earlier on is talking about informed, intelligent discussion, throwing words around like unhinged, uh, whatever we just used, that these are not attached to anything, that's just not true. They are attached to a thought process. It, it may have produced a, a conclusion that you don't like, but they are attached to a process. Uh, and to suggest they're not, it does not help us move forward the argument. And, and uh, you know, again, as, as Ellie said, the point of fairness is one about a finite council budget in a city of increasing need, uh, in the c increasing cost of meeting those needs, means that we're in a precarious situation. And there's not an area of local government activity that's not been impacted by our financial situation uh, we're in. So addressing that context as well, and, and at least acknowledging it, is incredibly um, important. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, the Mayor Marvin Rees there ending that little clip from this week's Cabinet meeting here in Bristol discussing the future of allotments. And listening to it, Annie, I did get the idea that uh, the Council sort of allow these things to go on. Obviously, they, are, they have to sit and listen to what people have got to say, but they don't really seem to have any intention of really listening. No, I was quite amused that Marvin complains that other people use his useful word salads when he's a champion of the word salad. <laughs> Which is essentially what he was doing. It's very dismissive of residents' views, especially when they've taken the time to turn up to public forum. And this is always his response to them. It's really disheartening. Well, this goes back, takes us back to governance, really. Uh, and uh, Joe's got a couple of things to ask you, I think, about monitoring. Well, the monitoring officer particularly. I mean, the, the, the other issue there is that, uh, as, as you were alluding to, there's been no... No complaints upheld for the last about the last six years, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's also, you know, it's come to light that the that the monitoring officer wasn't even following the law um, that's laid out in the Localism Act mm -hmm. 2011, that says that you've got to have an, you've got to have an independent person to assess complaints about councillors that come in, and that independent person has to be uh, voted into position by full council mm -hmm. by councillors. Which hadn't which, ha which hadn't been happening since he'd been um, monetary officer, and, th and that's been pointed out by various members of the public who are very persistently keep bringing this up mm -hmm. at different committees, even at full council. Observed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even at full council to the mayor, and and and, and the, the mayor turns around and says, "I can't I can't comment on this. This has nothing to do with me. This is a uh, you know the executive has nothing to do with the uh, complaints procedures. This is all down to." this particular committee called the Values and Ethics Committee. And there's this sort of strange situation where it's what everyone can see that the Emperor's wearing no clothes, but no one in the council, councillors or anyone is prepared to say, you know, the, the guy, the, 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 the top lawyer in the council who's supposed to be telling everyone else how the law works hasn't been following the law, you know, mm. the, 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 the states, how local government is supposed to work. Well, it's the extraordinary um, thing about local government and politics generally is it's politics and yet so much of it is classed as non-political appointment even mm. though it very every, everything about it is political mm. of course it is and everything about all of the officers role is mm. political even though they're technically classed as non-political appointments mm. which is where um, for example there's a new finance officer coming in that's being appointed by the current administration Technically, it's a non-political appointment. Mm. Um, the chief executive is a non-political appointment. The monitoring officer is a non-political um, appointment. And therefore, 
it's made, but it can be made by the administration. It is made by the administration, mm. and so therefore, you have political interests. Yes, yeah, yeah exactly. So it's um, and yeah, it's a contradiction, and, and particularly in a mayoral system, that's all quite that top-down thing is mm. concentr- very concentrated. And I, another one I'd I'd point to would be the um, the chief planner, you mm-hmm. know, who who you know I think was appointed as as. You know, in, in in a political sense again, because there's someone someone who used to work with the chief executive of the Southwest Regional Development Agency, uh, and was brought was brought in to fulfil a sort of pol- a politically mandated mm-hmm. um, project of how we're going to manage the planning department and what's going on with planning. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so which I mean, we might get on to generally mm. okay before we talk about planning a bit um i'd like to say something about send uh, because this uh special educational needs mm. kids i mean for me this is almost one of the major issues that we've had to deal with over the last eight years or so is the underfunding of of um the education of children with special education. I mean, these are the people that desperately need a really decent education. They need a specialist education. And it's almost as if, uh, well, it's survival of the fittest. Sorry, you're not, you're not um, able-bodied enough to go to a proper school, therefore uh, we're not going to be spending money on you. So there's something a little bit fascistic about the uh, failure to fulfil this. And actually, of course, it's a statutory um, obligation of the council to do it. Now, money has been spent on things like the Colston Hall renovation, it's been spent on um, the Bristol Energy. There's been actually tens of millions spent on these projects, but they're not seen as a priority, it seems to me, Annie. Yeah, well, so I have particular skin in this particular game. So I'm neurodiverse myself, and I also have a neurodivergent um, child who didn't have a school place for three years, and we had to home educate him. He's recently gone back into mainstream um, provision, but, you know, they haven't had the Senko for the first uh, term. Uh, the amazing school but no senko so he's not actually been getting the provision because our kids are not even when they're in mainstream school aren't being given the provision that they require to really thrive um and it was a massive fight to get him diagnosed in the first place that that took i think five or six years to get him through that you know and it's it's a huge issue it's a issue across the country but it's particularly an issue in bristol that we're not taking seriously enough and it is a massive failing well there's some good news apparently um announced by marvin's i'm not sure if she's deputy mayor whatever she is asha craig um and uh, so that was talked about also um at cabinet on tuesday uh so agenda item 30 Uh, safety valve and this as I said earlier on was introduced under APR 16. Asha you're bringing this item. Thank you. This report outlines our submission to be part of the Department for Education Safety Valve program. The Safety Valve program is intended to support local authorities to manage the historical deficits in their dedicated school grants. The terms of an agreement are not yet confirmed by the DfE, but we do anticipate it to be in line with the proposal we submitted in January, which will see funding of around $100 million. This includes a contribution over five years from central government, totaling around $54 million, with a contribution from Bristol City Council of around $43 million. This is a huge opportunity for Bristol to accelerate the reforms needed to help improve outcomes for children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities, whilst operating in a financial, sustainable way. So uh, that's Asha Craig there speaking at Cabinet on Tuesday this week, Annie. Uh, And actually, it's almost like she's got her fingers crossed there. Uh, We hope to get this money from central government. Mm -hmm. Um, This is a bit of an awful way for a big city like Bristol to be running the show, isn't it? To be hoping that they're going to get an extra grant from the council. And actually, what's happened over the the decades is that, that central government has been cutting back and cutting back the amount of money that... Um, that the, the they're giving to local authorities to carry on. In fact, he's slowly starving us. Mm-hmm. So, again, I mean, part of this is a governance issue. It's something that they knew was a problem and they hid it until the very last minute and snuck it out at this point when we've only, I think, it had like five minutes to spare on uh, member, f- member questions that could, could have been asked, but they put it out on the Monday to come to cabinet on the tuesday so the very last last possible minute not meeting even their minimum statutory regulations for this um but also 
yeah, a whole basis of maybe they can get some stuff from central government. This is on the basis that we're all fairly sure that when there's a next general election, it's going to be a Labour government. Labour are fairly sure that they are going to take the administration. And Labour have also said, uh, the, the government, and Labour have also said that they're not going to give local government and local authorities any more money than they we're already getting. So therefore, the whole premise of this is highly questionable because on one hand, the current Labour administration is tying the next administration into this for six years, because that's how long it runs for, which is longer than the term of the next administration, because that would be a four-year term. They're tying it into something on a wing and a promise of that a future central government may or may not give to us. It all feels very dirty, and it, the only people are going to, the people are really going to suffer is going to be the children. And it's, I think it's a really despicable thing to do at this stage of an administration. Uh, well, surely, I mean, at least they've put in an application for this money. I mean, at least they're trying to get some money from central government. It's, it's, it, surely it's, it's, it's actually not local authorities' fault. I mean, one of the Labour people will argue is saying, well, we're just having to cope with these cuts from central government. It's not really our fault. I mean, just asking and like you say fingers behind your back potentially it's not really quite good enough it's something that has been facing us for a very long time and we've already sort of not given enough school provision places knowing that a baby boom was at its peak sort of 10 years ago not making any provision for that is it's too little too late and it's it's also just a bit of a gamble that doesn't seem to pay off and it isn't going to actually mean anything good for well, children um let's let's hope that some of this money comes through but it would be not much nicer if the council just prioritized this a little bit more than they do uh, some of the other pet projects uh listen we had a budget in central government this week i always mm. look at those jeremy hunt whenever i see him my heart sinks uh, I just think, oh, yes, this is the guy that said there'd be no top-down reorganisation of the National Health Service, and then he did a top-down reorganisation of the National Health Service, which caused absolute chaos around 2012. And then he went into uh, the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, uh, and he got rid of all the rules for local um, commercial radio stations to be... Uh, actually local and so you've got big companies like global taking up every single uh, license and saying well that, that license that you won well i'll tell you what we'll have it now and so there isn't really such a thing anymore as mm. a commercial local radio so he's uh, now in charge of all of our money which really made my heart sick but anyway uh, but the, the week before i think it was uh, uh, the, the budget was passed here now this is a deal which uh, i think the greens objected to but uh, it was the conservatives and labor together that got mm -hmm. it through so this is a this is a, bit, a potentially worrying model where you've seen the two main opposition parties actually saying you know let, i'll tell you what let's just uh, get into bed with each other and make sure this budget goes through so what mm -hmm. did you make of that whole debacle yeah i mean i think it's very concerning that um labor would rather uh, side and make a deal with the conservatives than they would work with us um as you know, the people closest to them on the political spectrum they'd rather not work with us they'd rather work with the conservatives and we will cut out from a real collaborative approach to this budget that will um be the budget that the future administration has to work with and you know they think it's going to be us as much as we think it's going to be us and yet they didn't uh, didn't actually involve the green party in forming that budget in any way whatsoever and when it came to amendments all that was left was that li little pots where you're kind of moving sort of seeing for peter to feed paul and actually there's not a lot of those little pots left so that we we managed to like, identify one very small pot that was possibly being used for knife crime and one bit which we could move to use for a different bit of knife crime mm. but like it's not it's not that's it's not a, that's not a collaborative approach no. to the budget well look uh, i remember george ferguson when he took over he was rather deft at moving stuff from one budget to another even though he'd been told you could use it for this he'd find some way of using it for something mm -hmm. else in order to keep the services running uh whereas that doesn't really happen and as part of that the planning um department of bristol city council has been absolutely denuded of staff i mean planners are experts in what they do if they're going to get it right also they tend to be hoofed out or elbowed out if they don't come out with the right decisions in this present administration mm -hmm. so joe i'd just like you to uh, ask 
uh, Annie a few questions about planning because this week we've had the announcement. Uh, it's funny because we had our discussion about St Mary Laporte. Mm. Immediately there was a, an announcement, uh, I think it was the following Monday, uh, in the Bristol Post that the government was thinking of uh, bringing Bristol planning under central government control and they've now actually done that, haven't they? Yeah. yeah. They've, they, they've done it for um, non-major applications. So it's not the really big stuff. Um, but it's it's um, applications that I think are ten dwellings or less or under half a hectare, um, and they now go to the planning inspectorate rather than Bristol City Council's planning department. Which um, and I and I think from what I understand that that, that actually came as quite a shock to um, the chief planner and 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 the, the senior council officers who who didn't think they were actually that was actually going to happen but they have now basically been been put in special measures and this that that, that is a consequence of uh well basically a huge backlog um in planning applications how, which, how many I, I, I don't know the number but it's been it's been building up i, mean, I think it's about 1700 it it if i remember okay. rightly but it, it's, i mean it's the, 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 they are one of the worst in the in the, in the country and that was a problem when the last head planner left, Gary Collins, last year, and they brought in a, in a, in a new chief planner, reformed the, sort of reformed the service. This and this was going to, uh, you know, try and streamline the 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 the, the, uh, the process uh, and sort sort this out. Um, but that hasn't happened. That hasn't happened. And 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 this is and it's it, as you said. This is it's well. It's under resourced. Yeah, but it's well, also look, it's also a question of losing. Annie staff here is chair of one of the planning committees, and we've got to be quite careful because you're not allowed to talk about specific applications. But do you want to ask her a few things about how we've ended up with um, Joe with this situation? Well, I mean, what, yeah, the sort of the thing the thing that I've been writing about and talking about recently is the is the the the, the political pressure on the uh, planning department. Mm. And um, but that is something you you know I don't believe that you you've been aware of, or you were aware of quite a while ago. Yeah. Um, but I guess uh, and, and and this this pressure is coming specifically from the mayor's office. Um, and then what you could see with uh, the the, the Samaria Laporte application in in historic heart of Bristol that I wrote a long piece about was that you that you you. You have uh, you have planning officers who have uh, basically said to developers this this application isn't acceptable. On this this case, it was the, the height, mm -hmm. the scale, the massing of these office blocks, um, and then they are that the, those same officers are then recommending that there's application for for approval, um, and. Um, yeah, I don't know if you've, you've got anything to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> I have many things to but, say yeah. about that. Um, yeah, so to, to, to start, um, so planning is a regulatory body and so the Bristol City Council is the planning authority and that's regulatory, again, supposed to be non-political. Mm. Um, but then planning as a strategy and where we build things is a political strategic activity mm. which comes directly under the mayor's own portfolio under in the cabinet, in, in the that's, cabinet. His that's his own things yeah. exactly um so it's a bit of a contradiction and those lines get a little bit blurred especially when the council is the applicant for something and so we saw it with utri farm we saw it see it with gorham for example which is a bit of a arm's length kind of company to which is a planning it's the so the building company the housing housing yeah, company yeah. um which is technically arm's length a little bit like bristol waste but it's also basically also the council's um company and then those lines get a bit blurred because you end up with officers who are planning officers and then officers who are the applicants sat there side by side doing the same thing and sometimes passing themselves off as just an officer and because we have such of a change around in planning officers all the time it's hard to keep up with whose face is who mm. and so sometimes i can be talking to somebody and it's only halfway through the conversation i realize that actually they're not a planning officer they are the applicant officer doing the site visit or representing yeah. um because they'll come uh, like at a planning committee for example 
council officers have a habit of sitting on the benches where the councillors are. I've started moving them off to the other end so it's a little bit clearer who is the applicant, mm. who is the planning officer, because we often have uh, additional planning officers there, like somebody from highway, somebody from legal, mm. that sort of thing, to give additional advice should be needed to during the committee. So that muddies the water quite a lot. And then because planning itself is a strategic um, political, it strategic. means, so, and it's strategic as well, it is the very clear aim of the administration to get certain things passed. And therefore, it does put planning officers in a tricky mm. position because the council's their employer at the uh, end of the day. Yeah, and, and the thing is, is that when it, in law, and in planning law and in our policies as well, our planning policies, there is an element of open to interpretation. Most things aren't that black and white. Mm. Um, well, there it's is some balance. It's weighing up the balance, isn't yeah. it? That's what, which they always say, and you get in every for all these big applications. Uh, and this is how the planning system mm. works: is that you've got to you've got to weigh up public benefits against harms that may be caused. Exactly. So yeah, but we I mean, we we had this week. And you um, gave a statement mm. at the the meeting about um, the, the, the tallest building mm -hmm. ever, that's ever going to be built. That's, that's now going to be built in uh, in Bristol. It's twenty eight story student accommodation mm. tower. Um, and so, so, so you've got again you've got this conversation about the the, the harms versus benefits. But uh, as you did in the St Mary Laporte application. Um, but as far as I can see, they've done exactly the same thing. Was what they did at St Mary de Port is is remove totally remove what the specialist conservation officers were saying, take it out of the report. And if you look through the report for this one that went through this week, there's no mention of of, of a con conservation officer, the advice they've given. Mm. And this this is the tallest building ever to be built in Bristol that stands right next to the oldest Grade One listed building in the city, St James's Priory. Mm -hmm. The 12th century church. So, and you know, you've got you've got legal precedent in 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 2021. Um, the, uh, the the Lewisham Council in London were told were were, were told by a High Court judge uh, that their planning permission had to be quashed for exactly this reason. They they hadn't shown the advice of the conserva the council's own conservation mm -hmm. officers. Um, so you know, as far as I can see, that, that they're not acting lawfully. But the but the thing with the planning system is that that can only be challenged by someone doing a judicial review in um, in the high mm. court, like like they did with the Lewisham Council, and that requires tens of thousands of pounds. So that's another aspect of it that you can you know, which allows them to tread this this, this line, um, and um, and get this get this stuff through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it disadvantages uh, the everyday resident, doesn't it? Yes. Because yes. I, I remember on on Wednesday when the the high building came, mm. um, officers advised that yes, there was massive harm to the conservation areas around it, to the heritage assets, to the local community, to the the fact it kind of breached the council's own um, policies on student density mm. as well and transient um, population density. Despite all those things, on balance, yeah, it outweighs. They can say that for anything, you know. Yeah, anything. You can you can choose um, it on balance. Yeah, as long as you give yeah. everything due regard, yeah. Then um, and consideration, yeah. You can, but yeah, but you, but they, 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 they do. They are supposed to follow a process of giving the councillors who are voting all the information they need, mm. the information from all, all, all the consultees within yeah. the transport, the, the the design offices, and and and. They're, they're, they're filtering that. Mm -hmm. Did you um, clock the advice that was given to councillors at the very beginning part mm, of the meeting yeah. about the dangers of actually going and getting officer yes, recommendation? Yeah. That was very concerning. Mm. So is that normal for them to warn you? That how dare you make sure you don't go against what the officers are recommending? That's what it came across like. I mean, that's, yeah. what, that's what it was. <laughs> that's that's, that's yes. why, yeah. Uh, it wasn't particularly subtle. No. Uh, that was, yeah, if you go against this planning... Um, recommendation then i mean it's what's the finish finish the sentence though yeah, what's the sorry. consequence so well 
What are they suggesting the consequences would be? That the council would have to be liable for all of the costs on appeal. And would, and appeal, yeah. and and would lose appeal on appeal. Yeah. yeah, which has always been the veiled threat that gets m sometimes more explicitly made and sometimes a little bit more covertly made at various points when it seemed like we were going to overturn an officer recommendation. It's certainly a repeat conversation I have with um, the head of planning off mm -hmm. of committee about trying to make sure that I make a committee follow the officer recommendation, mm -hmm. which is not my job. Mm -hmm. um, but to have it made quite so explicitly is... Um, Unusual. But the, the other thing that tr one of the things that troubles me about the planning committees is, is the way that the councillors are so reliant on the officer's direction and, and, mm. and advice and opinion, and it seems to me that I, you know very very few of those councillors, even the ones that have sat on those planning committees for years, have actually read the local plan and the national planning policy framework, which are the two documents that all planning applications are assessed against. And you all, you're always getting these very basic questions going to the the case officer. Um, is, uh, what, what, what is what is the what is the training that the um, the, the councillors on the committees get? Well, I mean, they're about, obviously about they're planning. not, on the whole, they're not lawyers or um, planning professionals. Mm. Um, I no, yeah. There are a couple, actually, who do have planning, um, professional planning experience and, and, and law degrees as well. So there are a couple of mm. counsellors who mm. do have that understanding. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the training generally, it's more about understanding what material consideration is and what some of the elements of it are there's certainly the deep dive into our policies is something that councillors are left to do a little bit more mm -hmm. themselves um on my committees i'm always very keen for it to not just be a rubber stamping exercise i think it's really important that uh, as a re regulatory body a planning committee follows so serves the same kind of process as a scrutiny committee in many ways of scrutinizing is this really the do the, does the do the councillors actually agree with the officer recommendation and mm. scrutinising a little bit more because that's, that's what their own critical faculties yes, and their own judgment. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, you know, my planning committee um, has rejected or got overturned officer recommendation quite a few times, which has caused a lot of questions. And the, but I think the wrong questions asked is not. Um, why are we rejecting the officer of recommendation? What can be done to make us follow the officer of recommendation? I think the question is why is the officer of recommendation so wildly different so often to the members who have taken into account their residents, the residents of Bristol's views? Because that's who we're there to to serve, and that's who we're there to represent. And so is the planning authority. And what the planning authority should be, be saying is, okay, so the councillors are listening to their residents and not agreeing with our recommendations. Why are we so out of step with what our residents want and what our residents mm. need and what they're asking for? Because the overwhelming reason for um, voting against officer recommendation is because it's just not good enough. You know, that mm. balance of it's not well, yeah, well, that's housing the, that, at any that's cost. That's the thing with, the, with this week. You know, mm. like you, you, you could just say 20, 28 stories is too high. You know, Historic England was saying this just need, it needs to take eight stories mm. off and then it might be reasonable. It's still not going to be great, but it's then reasonable. Um, but there seems to be no appetite even, even to, to push the developers to do that. Mm. No. Well, I mean, yeah. there, there was a desire from the Mayor's office for tall buildings. Mm. They, they like that. They like quite as like us to sort of be a bit more like Manchester in that regard. Um, but I think explicitly what was being included in the application in those 28 stories and the lower block as well is something that we don't need or shouldn't be advocating for in Bristol. What, what do you make of the, the irony, Annie, that uh, it now looks as if there may not be the money, the finance available for uh, this big development in the city centre to go ahead? So there's a massive battle over whether they can actually get the uh, planning application through at St Mary Le Port, and then suddenly they say, well, no, it doesn't look like the money stacks up anymore. Maybe the economy's changed, mm. we're in recession, and so uh, doesn't it, does it feel sometimes like the whole thing's a bit of a pointless exercise? <laughs> We welcome to politics sometimes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the amount of planning applications that have been approved that are just sat there 
not being built so plots of empty land you know that is one of the real problems we've got mm-hmm. about ha- the housing crisis that like developers just sit on, on builds they make applications they don't necessarily build it yeah. or they build it and they don't necessarily rent it out immediately they certainly don't no. sell it or put it all onto the market at the same time they sit on this stuff to inflate yeah, the market well, right, even more. right here in st paul's we've got a massive piece of land that was i think it was um, one of the big housing associations um bought uh, bit by bit, and it's just been m- must best part of a decade. It's just been sitting there. Is that the bit behind Circa Media? Yeah, but birds landing on it, sort mm-hmm. of looking around. Well, nothing much going here, taking mm-hmm. off again. Every now and again, there seems to be some kind of like circus come in and mm-hmm. uh, set up shop and then go. But this, of course, is prime house building land right near the city centre, isn't it? Like green policy, isn't yeah. There? Well, uh, well, Tony Dyer was talking about mm-hmm. um, a couple of months ago about this a green oh about empty homes and yeah, yeah. so uh, well, two things one i was going to say if you've been the big piece of land just behind uh circa or so by the garage yeah. there there is outline planning that came through um dcb a couple of maybe six months ago yeah i think so that there is something but just outlines so it will take a while longer for yep. it to go but yeah I, exactly it's like a big empty plot of land empty homes that was a, a motion that we brought um in when was it December, I think, mm. um, lose track of time, uh, to m- look explicitly at all of the empty properties that we've got, see what can be brought back into use. And Because if you look at how many empty properties that we've got, that would actually make a sizable uh, dent in our uh, homelessness um, list, the amount of for people we've got that don't have accommodation. There's... Um, there are obviously empty blocks, uh, there are offices and blocks that were residential that are just empty. There's one by the Beacon, for example, called Amelia Court. That's been boarded up for years and years. That could be brought back into use. There's loads of yeah. units across the city. Well, I think be you should be liaising use. with uh, my other hat, which is Bristol Housing Action, the local mm-hmm. squatting group. Because there's quite a lot of people who would be very happy to use some of those buildings as somewhere to stay. But look, you're going to have to get cracking any second mm-hmm. now. So let's uh, quickly have a listen to another clip from Ch- Tuesday, uh, which is about Yew Tree Farm. Uh, just a little bit of context. This is a council-owned farm uh, where the uh, there's been uh, all sorts of attempts to grub up, um, uh, well, basically to use the land for other things. Uh, um, maybe you could tell us what's going on there when we hear this clip from uh, from Tuesday, Annie. Dan, you have a minute. It's great that Thank this you. council has applied for money from the West of England Green Recovery Fund. But what's the point of saying you'll proactively form relationships with stakeholders and communities across the city? Why would anybody engage with this council? I mean, you have forums and consultations to communicate with the public, but you just ignore them when they don't go along with your plans. This council has a real problem with only talking to people who will agree with what you want the council to do and talking about things that make you look good. You had a farmer who cared for a site of nature conservation interest, but it appears you don't like to hear about protected species. Instead, you've put someone in charge who has a clear desire to develop on that land. We can't even expect the Cabinet Member for Ecology to speak out about what is happening at YouTube Farm because the company they work for has Red Row for a client who expressed an interest in building on that land. Why would anyone talk to you when you only talk to people when it's convenient for you? Yeah, that's a pretty damning, um, uh, well, it wasn't really a question, statement. Uh, but what's happening with Yew Tree Farm? Because this is quite, obviously, the, the council is trying to make sure that the bits and pieces of land, which are uh, farming land, producing food, that sort of thing, that they do control, are being kept productive. But apparently that's not happening at Yew Tree. No, so at Yew Tree, there's three different parts of the farm that are owned by different organisations or different people. So there's a part of the farm that is owned by the council and that's a bit that the cemetery is being expanded into, uh, which is the one that came to uh, the planning committee back in November. Um, that's an SNCI, so a special site of nature interest, conservation interest, um, which has got dormice and all sorts of protective species on it. Uh, and then there's a different part of it, also part of an SNCI, um, I believe, that Red Row are trying to expand into and build homes onto. And then there's a different bit again, which I'm not even sure what's going on that bit, but um, that had a hedgerow chopped down at several points. I think there was an application that was put in to chop down the hedgerow. The planning department didn't... 
respond to it in time and so therefore they got a permission by default mm -hmm. so then this bit of the hedgerow was chopped out and and there's ancient trees there over sort of 200 year old trees um and part of the hedgerow was chopped out but in the wrong place according to the application but bigger than it needed to be and they put concrete in all sorts of things it's and also dormice breeding season is march and i know they were back there today doing some things as well so there's a and even wildlife trust objected in the strongest terms to the cemetery expansion into that part of yew tree farm and that was completely dismissed at planning um and they were dismissed as not knowing what they were talking about um and even the wildlife trust i believe have issued a cease and desist on the council to make them try to get them to stop doing action and to provide enforcement there so that nobody is doing any work on that land and that's not what happened uh, what about this this conflict of interest this is what bothers me so much about council uh, councillors, council officers that are also moonlighting for a company that's got an interest in a particular site. Yeah, I mean this is a, this is a very very clear uh, example of conflict of interest because you've got uh, as it was Dan, o uh, Dan Aykroyd who was giving that statement in the, in the council on the clip we just heard um, talking about the the, 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 the Labour cabinet lead for ecology. So this this, this whole situation at Yew Tree Farm um is absolutely about uh, ecology and what council ecology officers are doing, and um, um, and he's he's uh, so this is Marley Councillor Marley Bennett, um, who also works for the planning and development consultancy Turley, um, who have this housing developer Red Row as one of their clients. Um, so, ha is it is it the question is is it feasible for him to speak out? you know, about what's happening to this ancient hedgerow that goes round this plot of land where one of the clients for the company that he works for wants to build houses. You, you know what I'm <laughs> thinking about? We need to go back to the monitoring officer again. We were talking <laughs> about this earlier on. There needs to be an eye kept on this sort of um, thing, surely to make sure that you haven't got people on both sides of the chessboard sitting in the same committee and making the same discussion uh, decisions. So... Obviously, all councillors are required to declare their interests. Um, some of those I think you can keep confidential if it's particularly sensitive, so people don't necessarily know about them. Uh, but then there's also a, a quantity of, when it comes to predetermination and that sort of thing, the bar is actually quite low, high, which I don't know which way around, but like in terms of if you can sit there and say, I've come to this with an open mind or <laughs> I'm, I'm, I can confidently say I'm not predetermined on this mm. issue, then that's good enough. I mean, surely the best thing to do, say, look, I mean, you've, you've got your own planning committee there. Mm. If you want to have an extension to your house out uh, the back garden, surely what you do is during that committee, you hand over the chair to somebody else and walk out the door. It would. Well, I mean, if my landlord wanted to build an extension on the house that I rent, then yes, I'd, I would still re recuse myself. But yes, not everybody. Well, I mean, when the councillor brings has any kind of planning application, that has to come to committee as a kind of, we don't do that and to get delegated in order to uh, make the uh, uh, full transparency of that sort mm. of thing. Um, but yeah, in terms of employment, there's a lot of people actually who do work for organisations that then, like, I believe somebody worked for the applicant on the zoo um, yeah. and then sat on that committee. Oh, God, for well, this is another yeah, thing. Like like people do do it, but. Um, we kind if of forget some of the big changes that there have been under Marvin Rees, and that is getting rid of Bristol Zoo. Uh, do, you, do you want to just remind us of the title of your article, um, Joe, where you do quite a, a deep look into some of the conflicts of interests and the friends of friends who've been recruited into the City Council yeah, to so help if, with if you, getting if, planning applications through? If you look on my substack, so I wrote a very long um, piece about... Hang on, uh, a, look, be, be honest... It's what? a book. It's a book, it? yeah. If, well, don't put people off, Tony. But, <laughs> no, but there is a short version. <laughs> there, there so, yeah. short. But it's um, but it, it's it, but it's, it's through th looking through this particular development, Samari Laporte, that I was talking about last time I was on, but also trying to give a a, a, a bigger overview of the 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 the, the, pla the, 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 the situation of planning and development in Bristol, and it applies to other cities. But it's 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 the revolving. It's a conflict of interest. The revolving door between the the public and the private sector um and the, in bristol it's about the the the, the, the pressure from the mayor's office on the planning department um 
And um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing, I think, consequences of this in in the fact the planning department is now under special measures. That's that's part of it. There are other factors, but it's part of it. Um, but you're still, it's still going on. You know, you, we saw this this week with the the, the tallest building that's ever going to be built, ever to have been built in Bristol, which went through this week. I think that they're, they're still doing the same stuff that I've been that I was writing about in there. You know, they're, they're still pushing their specialist officers, keeping them out of the reports, not giving councillors the, f- the fuller information, um, and, 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 and trying, and, and, you know, trying to, especially now with a couple of months left of this uh, mayoral system, you know, trying to get these big applications through um, mm. while they can. Are they getting them through your committee? No. <laughs> um, okay. You can read into that what you will as to okay. how well, sideline uh, is. <laughs> also, um, we've got, um, we've got uh, the mayor has announced that he's applying for this job when he finishes uh, at UN Habitat, which is looking after the urban environment right across the world for the United Nations. Do you think he's got a good chance of, of getting that job? And how do you think he'd get on if he does? Okay, I mean, he talks a good talk, but he doesn't walk it very well um it would be i think very disappointing for the climate should he actually and the habitat generally should he get that job but i'm not on his interview panel so i couldn't possibly tell you if you'll get it oh, i wish you were but anyway <laughs> we can wish away can't we uh also we've got this clean air zone this mm-hmm. has caused quite a lot of trouble particularly um a lot of people saying well it's actually not uh, making the air any cleaner because people go mm. round the zone, drive further, produce more pollution, mm. um, and uh, particularly the, the the sort of non-green side of this because people are having to sell cars, perfectly good cars mm. that work very well, but and buy new ones. So it's almost like a kind of help to buy scheme for the car industry as well. So, what do you approve of the clean air zone? Do you think it's really about clean air, and is it going to stay? I mean, the clean, we wouldn't have implemented this scheme in this way is the starting point of it. We wouldn't have done this because it's not, it's all been a bit of a hot mess. Um, and it's sort of been almost set up to fail in quite a lot of ways. But then that goes for quite a lot of our walking and as our active travel infrastructure historically, it has walking and cycling in conflict with each other rather than um, complementary um methods of travel yeah, well um, the other major major thing is we've been cutting buses haven't we mm. uh, right right the way through covid and since covid loads of buses cut something like i think a total of 30 percent of all the buses bus journeys in bristol uh, so the idea is if you're not gonna you want to get people to use the bus the bus has got to be there yeah but, i mean replacement cars is the one kind of carrot we want kind of more buses um as as part of the solution but also making it safer to walk and travel and, and cycle around and, and those ways of of uh, transport but also they're making it so that people who do need to drive people who are doing trades vehicle people with mobility issues who blue badge holders for example they do need to drive and we want to make it so that they can they do need to get to the hospital mm. they do need and there's lots of things that we could do to make it more accessible to get to the hospital for example but with, none of that is happening and actually everybody's being disadvantaged and disenfranchised except for the people who can afford to drive in is it just a, a way of making money? Is that what it's really about? Or is it really about clean air? What do you think? I mean, I've been looking over the city. Obviously, I've lived in the city many years and I've seen a lot of restrictions uh, of, of um, roads, making them narrower, mm-hmm. cutting roads off. This has actually done, I think, more to reduce uh, traffic in the set- centre than the zone has. Well, I, I mean, they were made to do it. That's the thing, is that they didn't particularly want to do it. They were forced to do it and they did it at the very, very last minute in the worst possible way. So what the actual aims of it are um slightly by the by in terms of the way in which they've implemented it hmm. is it going to expand do you think under the greens i don't know i mean we're definitely going to look at um parking zones central parking zones resident parking zones how they work how they operate because they had massive hu- price hikes recently as well um making sure it's equitable making sure it covers all the areas that people want it to as well um there's a lot of things that need to be looked at and reconsidered and re-evaluated as to does this work has this actually been set up to cause conflict or to exasperate an issue rather than solve it 
that is a massive piece of work that we'll have to do. Okay. And are we going to see our first Green MP in Bristol, do you think, uh, when it comes to the general election? Let's hope. The well, signs are looking you, good. You're in central ward mm-hmm. here, so uh, there's this new central... Um, constituency. Constituency. Uh, I mean, I'm miffed that they've called it after mine, but... Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What, what's, your, what's your guess? I, I think she's got a very good chance, yeah. But who is standing? Who it's is it? Carla Denia. Oh, right, OK. Who is co-leader of the Green Party nationally as well. Okay. And current councillor for Clifton Down. Well, thanks very much for coming in and chatting with us. I think you better scoot off to your Palestine thing mm-hmm. in Castle Park. Uh, Annie Stafford Townsend, Green Councillor for Central Ward here in Bristol. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me.
Welcome to the revolution. Uh, the revolution will will not be televised, but it will be here on not the BCFM politics show. Uh, so that's uh, high res. Welcome to the resolu- revolution. And um, if the algorithms were working really nicely, so you could dial that up on YouTube, and you'll find lots and lots of other brilliant, really up to date, radical stuff that you won't hear on the BBC, and you won't hear it anywhere else apart from on little alternative podcasts like this, because they hate it. Uh, they hate those sorts of um, brilliant songs like those guys have been producing in the states. There, uh, before that, uh, we had a little bit of disco. I hope you were doing a you know, disco dancing at home to that. Uh, it was called "Spacer" by Sheila B. Devotion. I'm, I'm willing to bet that was sometime during the 1970s. Uh, and before that, uh, I'm not quite sure. I think it might be even from Handel's Messiah or something. Uh, anyway, welcome to back to not the BCFM politics show with Irish Republican Labour activist Martin Summers, who we didn't hear from very much in uh, part one, uh, and me, Tony Gosling. Also, uh, Joe Banks is still with us, and we're now uh, joined also by Judith Brown. Hi, Judith. Uh, nice to see you. Uh, Hi, Tony. Thanks for inviting me. And you were ba- back from the Middle East recently. Uh, and I know yes, you had a I bit of an illness, which is a yeah. shame because yeah. you couldn't do quite as much as you wanted no, to indeed. do. No, indeed. But uh, anyway, it was sunny. Uh, good. <laughs> uh, well, yes, it's hot and sunny, man. Hot and <laughs> sunny. What are you, a lizard man? <laughs> anyway, um, so what, what, uh, what are your thoughts about the recent developments? I mean, you, you can, maybe you could just start by telling us something about your connection to Yemen because very few people really seem to understand this country. Uh, yeah. And it is a relatively recent recently created country uh, if you look at it historically it's kind of part of saudi arabia part of the Ar- uh, arabian, no, 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 Ra- no. arabian peninsula yeah, you've, got it, you've got it completely wrong tony Good. Um, well, yemen, yemen is as old as china um it's wow. uh, it's been within the same boundaries with the same people and and more or less the same um languages for um uh, since, uh, it's as old as china so and I'm it's the, they're, the, the they're the two they're the two oldest countries in the world and it's a country that wasn't kind Carved up, but by the British, they did try to take um, the South, um, but it's it, it's back now. Um, but they didn't rename it; they didn't give it a different name. Uh, where and Amman too was um, was its was its own country. But nearly all of the other countries in uh, the Middle East and Arabia were created, including Saudi Arabia, of course, which was created by the British in 1934. I think this is the Sykes Pico Agreement, which was secret. Am I right, Martin? The Russians revealed that after the revolution. Uh, they they'd seen it or something i think so yes yeah. Yeah. So that, that, it was a secret agreement yeah. but the bolsheviks said well because they got access to the because the russians were involved in it as well actually no, saudi arabia wasn't created by the site Pico arrangements. Yeah. It was created um the uh, british um so sykes Pico is after world war one um, yes, it was, and it was. It, it involved the French and and the British, and it involved the um, the Levant. You know, the um, um, uh, where Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, and Palestine is now mostly. But the uh, the British created Saudi Arabia, and they did it by um, um, uh, there was a very small sect called the Wahhabis who were very extremist and they um, they they sort of like got them to join with a family called the Sauds and then they sort of um, dis- uh, created this sort of like extremist state and which initially was was quite successful militarily it took part of Yemen um, which is now the south um, west corner of Saudi Arabia but Yemen is a very ancient land and um, uh, and and I think that of course I think that it, um, for many years it was the for many centuries really it was the richest um, country in the world um, wow. and uh, because it controlled trade because it's in the middle there between um, Africa well, Asia and they, Europe they're now doing again yeah, yeah. indeed they are and uh, it controlled trade and it um, it um, also it particularly controlled the incense trade and it also um, uh, uh, controlled the coffee trade through its port Mocha. so um so for many years it was a very wealthy country and i think that's was what what has been quite interesting is that it built these like amazing buildings and then because yemen became poor people didn't knock the buildings down but they stayed living in these ancient buildings so you've got things like the old city in sana three thousand years old which is still being lived okay in. well this is a big yeah. big 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 question yeah. here yeah. and i'm not sure if you're going to be able to answer it but i mean we've obviously got 
um, quite a lot of these UNESCO World Heritage Sites in yes. Yemen uh, yeah. because it's such a brilliant it, uh, hotbed of history. Yeah. Uh, and yet it's been being pounded by the British and the Saudis uh, for the last yeah. decade or so. So Absolutely. is anything left? Well, I think, yes, I think that there's parts of the old city, I think they, they, altogether they dropped three major bombs on it and that, that demolished some houses and, and, and also damaged quite a lot more. But, um, and, and there are certain other sort of like uh, important sites um, that, that have been damaged. Um, but of course the most important site in, in Yemen really, which was one of the top UNESCO sites, was the island of Socatra, which uh, the Yemenis had been amazing custodians of. Um, it's, um, it, it was completely unique um, and it was completely uncivilized. We actually they built a runway there in in, um, in 1999 and we were one of the first people who went there as tourists david and i and uh, and they didn't have they didn't have roads and they didn't have an airport but they had a runway and when we flew in we were actually met by the minister of tourism which is quite incredible but now i think did that you have you to show your passport <laughs> no because we were flying from yemen to yemen oh all right yeah Fair enough. yeah it's a bit yemen. like london city airport yeah, i was thinking because yeah. they're not showing their passports a lot of the planes landing yeah. uh, in london city airport either but look i mean there's also of course the horrific um death toll in yemen this is al jazeera reporting yeah uh th nearly four hundred thousand deaths uh by the end of what's that 2022 22 yeah yes by the end of 2021 uh, this is quite an old report yeah uh as i as a, from memory i think it was up over nearly half a million people in yeah. yemen had been killed yeah. at that point i, think, I mean that's I horrific think, i think not only sort of like killed um uh, but i think that, uh, that a lot of deaths have been caused by starvation because there was a very long embargo in which the british government and was, cholera i think was a well. part indeed and when cholera happened the Saudis went in and bombed the water water supply the sewage supply and the and the cholera hospitals they bombed a, a brand new hospital built by msf in um which was dedicated to cholera um as soon as as soon as cholera outbreak started so um i mean there have been horrific things going on there and uh, i think that um they were hoping that they were going to have peace the old man um uh, negotiated peace deals with all of the factions in in yemen which is now quite divided with lots of warlords can controlling their little part of Yemen and the accords were going on quite well Saudi Arabia agreed to pay all of the civil servants in Yemen um, and uh, we, who haven't been paid since about 2017 when the central bank was closed um, by Hardy um, and then the Americans decided that they'd send an envoy along to help along the peace talks and of course since then they've collapsed right well mm. uh, those yemeni people must be um uh, pretty angry against the west in a way it's this war has been a recruiting sergeant um for the, because they are really the only country which is putting in major support for the palestinian yeah. cause in gaza yeah. aren't they they are. Although, having said that, although I think that the Houthi regime um, now is popular throughout the Arab world um, and was popular many years ago in Yemen, um, but it has lost its popularity because it's as corrupt as everyone else. So, um, and uh, so I, th I think that uh, a lot of Yemenis um, they accept that that the Houthis um, control um, well n not half of Yemen, but the the, the 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 part of Yemen that's got most of the population in it, I mean it's an acceptance, but of course the Houthis are the old related to the old monarchy which people had had a revolution to get rid of, so so therefore, um, uh, but they're descendants of of the old, of the um, of the old uh, king of, or, or whatever he called himself of of Yemen that was deposed in the 1960s, so uh, the Houthis have a sort of like a, a mixed reputation in Yemen. And at the moment, I think people are disappointed because last year they were hoping for peace accords, which meant that they would get employment back and things going back to normal in Yemen. But in fact, now they've got, uh, they've got bombs coming again. Um, but in the rest of the Arab world, I mean, people sort of keep telling me this is amazing because they know that I've got connections with Yemen and they keep sending me sort of like notes saying this is fantastic. They've been talking about it on, on television in Tunisia or whatever. 
and uh, and everybody thinks the Houthis are amazing. So, um, so we, well, they, I think yeah. we we can say on this show yeah. we do too. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, yeah. Although, of course, yeah. we don't want to see anyone killed. No. Uh, you know, this is sending a very clear signal, Martin, isn't it, yeah. to uh, the British, the Americans, the Israelis, that uh, if you want to keep ca- trading through the Red Sea, through the Suez Canal, uh, you're going to have to stop killing Palestinians, stop killing Gazans. Well, when you say people haven't been killed, they have been killed, uh, people killed by the Americans and the British, and, you know, they've killed the Yemeni soldiers, and there's some sailors that died this week on a ship, an American registered ship, which the Houthis, and Sir Allah, as I prefer to call them, attacked. Because, of course, the Houthis is what their opponents call them, and and, of course, it's possibly legit, but I think it's, you know, the use of language helps people to sort of frame things, you know. Well, Yemenis will do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, but anyway, the point is that what they've been doing is, is very powerful because it's commercially uh, I mean the Israeli economy is in free fall partly as a result of this and they were they and they weren't doing full on attacks they were, they've, they've, they've kept the escalation ladder very carefully they, they weren't attacking British and American ships either they're just retaliating when the British and Americans attack them and other ships are being allowed through although there was some report this week that there's these uh, fiber optic cables have been cut but the Yemeni, uh, the Yemeni said that they didn't do that. I don't think that they'd be able to do it. Well, exactly. It's quite <laughs> difficult to do it. Yeah. In any okay, case, so that's, yeah. just a, that, yeah. that's just... Yeah. If that well, happens, just, so just that's a general up, attack on the whole of humanity. Just up a story on Middle East Eye, the picture of a rather low-in-the-water, well, it's sinking, ship uh, sunk by a Houthi missile attack. Um, did it sever the Red Sea internet cables? Uh, damage to fibre-optic cables in the Red Sea has laid bare how vulnerable global internet traffic is to disruption and the lack of alternative routes through the middle east so uh is this um do, what do you what do you think is it well i, I think, think that there's, an awful, just, there's an awful lot of psych- have just switched them there's on. a lot of psychological warfare going on they're trying to make justify what they're doing they're trying to find a posse to go and fight fight in yemen and and of course the way it's been pushed in our media is we've got to do this because it's keeping global trade going they're just trying to destroy the world economy that is not as i see it what they've been doing they've been very very cautious about escalating yeah. and i don't think they would do something i mean they've said they've said we didn't do it because that's just a random attack on random stuff yeah which is may- not what we're about yes see, and also we were discussing last week weren't we how easy it is uh, to put a signature of some other country on an internet attack of some sort and of course t- if you cut a cable that could be all sorts of different people well, that's right the Nord Stream cables. 2 Absolutely. pipeline as we all know exactly. was blown up by Putin this this <laughs> sends, <laughs> of course this sends, <laughs> a, really, this sends a very clear message to <laughs> yeah. all of the um uh, it obsessed security structures around the world oh look the yemenis are cutting your uh, surveillance <laughs> yes, uh, exactly. lines and, and, exactly. and so there may well be a psychological yeah. element to that yeah. uh, anyway what, what how do you think it's going this campaign of the houthis to stop this traffic through the red sea well, and through through the Suez? well it's it's amazing because um in in history there's not been anyone with a who hasn't had a large navy and a lot of money that's been able to um enforce an embargo and yemen is the first country that hasn't got a large navy and and hasn't got much money that's actually been able to enforce is this because of the missile technology that they're using it's because of the missile technology and in fairness it's because there's a very narrow gap at the babel mandab and so therefore they uh, that's that is yemeni waters the babel mandab and uh, and traffic that goes up the Red Sea and then along the Suez Canal has to go through the Babel Mandab. So that's the 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 reason is because they've got a very narrow um, uh, part to um, to to, um, uh, to actually control. But the mus- the missiles are as uh, sophisticated and um, and uh, and Yemen is is d- is designing them themselves and are producing they, they, I mean, them themselves. I mean, what we're probably going to hear all over our news programmes here is, oh, that they are they're really just proxies for Iran. Yemen Yemenis aren't proxies for anyone. <laughs> they're a very independent people, and um, and uh, I, I, I th- well, in fact, funnily enough, before 2015, Iran who supports everybody who's uh, sort of like. a 
protest or a dissident group actually were supporting the southern Yemen who uh, wanted to succeed from north Yemen and, and become independent again. So it wasn't until after the start of the war um, that uh, that Iran became involved in Yemen and, um, and it wasn't until um, Saleh, the ex-president, was killed by by the Houthis. I'll say it's the Houthis because there's an interesting um, uh, reason for that. They, it was um, uh, uh, it, they they actually did call themselves the Houthis at one point. They named themselves after um, a martyr who was killed, and but they've more recently taken on the name Ansarallah. And uh, yes, yeah, so. Um, I've, I've forgotten my point well, look, now. Uh, oh, well, I will, I will move things on a little bit, if you don't mind, because yeah. this time last week we had the most bizarre thing on the home front we're talking about here, yeah. uh, with Rishi Sunak coming out uh, around about 7 o'clock <laughs> in the evening outside Downing Street, whilst one of those wonderful protesters, you can hear them screaming away in the background against the war, uh, he's, he's explaining, and here's a... Um, a short excerpt from his <laughs> talk, uh, all about how dangerous it is to, uh, for the British people to elect somebody like George Galloway. We are a country where we love our neighbours and we are building Britain together. But I fear that our great achievement in building the world's most successful multi-ethnic, multi-faith democracy is being deliberately undermined. There are forces here at home trying to tear us apart. Since October the 7th, there have been those trying to take advantage of the very human angst that we all feel about the terrible suffering that war brings to the innocent, to women and children, to advance a divisive, hateful ideological agenda. On too many occasions recently, our streets have been hijacked by small groups who are hostile to our values and have no respect for our democratic traditions. Membership of our society is contingent on some simple things, that you abide by the rule of law and that change can only come through the peaceful democratic process. Threats of violence and intimidation are alien to our way of doing things. They must be resisted at all times. Nearly everyone in Britain supports these basic values, but there are small and vocal hostile groups who do not. Islamist extremists and the far right feed off and embolden each other. They are equally desperate to pretend that their violence is somehow justified when actually these groups are two sides of the same extremist coin. Neither group, except that change in our country can only come through the peaceful democratic process. Both loathe the pluralist modern country we are. Both want to set Britain against Britain to weaponize the evils of anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim hatred for their own ends. The faith of Islam, peacefully practiced by millions of our fellow citizens, is emphatically not the same thing as the extremist political ideology of Islamism which aims to separate Muslims from the rest of society. Islamist extremists and far-right groups are spreading a poison. That poison is extremism. It aims to drain us of our confidence in ourselves as a people and in our shared future. They want us to doubt ourselves, to doubt each other, to doubt our country's history and achievements. They want us to accept a moral equivalence between Britain and some of the most despicable regimes in the world. They want us to believe that our country, and the West more generally, is solely responsible for the world's ills, and that we, along with our allies, are the problem. In short, they want to destroy our confidence and hope. We must not allow that to happen. When these groups claim that Britain is and has been on the wrong side of history, we should reject it and reject it again. No country is perfect. But I am enormously proud of the good that our country has done. Our place in history is defined by the sacrifices our people have made in the service of their own freedom and that of others. And when these groups tell our children that they cannot and will not succeed because of who they are, 
when they tell children that the system is rigged against them or that Britain is a racist country. This is not only a lie, but a cynical attempt to crush young dreams and turn impressionistic minds against their own society. I stand here as our country's first non-white prime minister leading the most diverse government in our country's history. If you listen to Rishi Sunak there, he's, he's attempting to p pretend to be even-handed. But what he's ultimately saying is that people who protest against the genocide in Gaza are extremists. Meanwhile, he's got people in his own party who say that Sadiq Khan, who's the democratically elected mayor of London, is controlled by Islamists. Whereas in actual fact, Al-Qaeda was created by our own intelligence services in the 1980s to fight the Russians. Everybody knows that, don't they? Yeah. Margaret <laughs> Thatcher created Al-Qaeda. And ISIS was created to fight, fight the Syrians. Well, exactly so. I mean, <laughs> I, mean and, and, and I wrote a letter to the London Review of Books years ago about this. It said, we all know, do we not, that Al-Qaeda was created by our intelligence services. Robin Cook, yeah. who was a foreign secretary, said Al-Qaeda just means the base. Actually, it's uh, a, ba a database held in a man Jordan of all the people from all over the world recruited, trained by our own int uh, intelligence services and special forces, and pushed into, into Afghanistan. Many of them from Tripoli in Libya, well, what the Libyan Islamic fighting group. What Many happened to Yemen. Robin Cook? Mm. Well, we all, yes, I know. And in other words, uh, uh, maybe, when, when, maybe next week we will have a little look yes, at that. Well, I know, that but, 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 but Rishi Sunak, of course, knows nothing about any of yeah. these things. He's never heard of, of uh, uh, Mary McCarthy, who was shot but dead in, what, in, in, what, what, in, in Queen's sounds, University, Belfast, Bar, at 23 so, years old. Um, Could have been ironic, the president of Ireland. Ironic dead. to me. He's, he's talking about forces here in the UK trying to tear us apart, small groups. Well, I look at the Cabinet and I think, well, actually, what you're doing by supporting genocide is is creating a massive fissure in the uk indeed well i i mean i've been protesting on behalf of palestine for decades now and i'll have to say this i've been on lot, so many marches and they always represented a diverse um se section of people um black people white people um asian people muslims jews um, christians people. yes always jews there and always identifying themselves as jews saying you know with placards saying not in my name um, and then of course some in traditional uh, Jewish clothes so so yes um, uh, so, so I think that the marches that have been on have not only been peaceful but they've been um, but they've they've been multicultural events yeah uh, response was quite interesting because that was actually a response to the election of George Galloway mm -hmm. as an MP um, bizarre thing that in fact I thought it was rather nice to hear and on several ma mainstream media channels uh, last Friday evening I heard well various people and on Saturday and over the weekend saying well this was a very strange speech that he gave and it was it was like that that the journalists are hinting there's something a little bit unhinged about that whole mm. affair which was quite nice to see mm. the the london media getting that um but the response from george galloway after uh, rishi sunak's uh, speech last friday evening uh, which unfortunately we didn't cover last friday we couldn't it was just uh, you know it was all happening whilst we were broadcasting uh here it is we at sky have spent some time today on the streets of rochdale and there are people who say that they feel intimidated oh, by people are like like you and the people that have supported you I have just and they, and they and they have pointed I out have that you have concentrated your campaign on foreign affairs and they worry that rochdale I, will not I be the winner it. that's my answer to you i was just elected with a thumping majority by the electorate in rochdale that's all that matters to me so why are there people in the streets of Rochdale today worried? Well, people voted yesterday, and they voted for me. Why is that difficult for you to grasp? Why are there people on the streets worried? There may be people who didn't vote for me who are worried, but the majority, the thumping majority, voted for me. I've got the mandate, and I'm going to the House of Commons with it. And it's a mandate, you think, to do what because there are people that listen to what you say mm. what you say about whether or not israel has a right to exist what you say about what many jewish people think are we, threatening we had this slogans. conversation last night why are you reheating it because in the light of the prime minister's in don't keep statement. telling me about the prime minister as if he was moses do you not respect the prime minister <laughs> he's, 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 i don't res do i respect the prime minister i despise the prime minister and well, guess what? Do. Guess oh, what? Millions and millions and millions of people in this country.
despise the Prime Minister. I don't respect the Prime Minister at all. What are you planning to do next week when you arrive in Parliament? Well, I'm meeting the Speaker on Monday morning and then I'll be introduced and sworn in. I'll be escorted by the Right Honourable David Davis MP, former Deputy Leader of the Conservative Party. I don't know why he would do that if he thought I was the kind of man you're clearly implying that I am. David Davis is one of the great parliamentarians uh, of today and this age. Uh, and I'll be taking my seat in the House of Commons and speaking for the people of Rochdale. That's what I was elected to do. And what is your message also to Keir Starmer? My message to Keir Starmer is that the skids are under you uh, in scores of Labour seats up and down the country because you've lost the trust You've lost the confidence Absolutely. of millions of your traditional loyal voters. Now we have had, we have now had an election where two of the candidates have alleged intimidation. The Prime Minister referenced that intimidation in his address you on the steps of... to the Prime Minister as if that's supposed uh, uh, to impress me. The Prime, Minister is a, the, the Prime Minister is a rather diminutive, diminished and degraded politician. He made a party political statement. I, I, I don't care about Rishi Sunak's attitude. What I care about is that the returning officer, a man of unimpeachable integrity, I'm sure you'll agree, declared it a free and fair election and me as the winner and Rishi Sunak as one of the crushed two big parties in the state. So yeah. why are two, what, so why are two are candidates... Keep repeating the same questions to me because I have other people to talk to. So let's make this the last one, shall we? we got a party to go with. Allegations of intimidation, allegations that your supporters intimidated That's other candidates. Five what times you've you said that. The returning officer declared it last night. You were there as a free and fair election and me as the winner. And the well, Electoral Commission and the Electoral Commission today you're, have said that they're gonna look and talk to the parties. To have to just suck it up. I won the election. Yeah. George Galloway, thank you very much indeed. That was George Galloway with his supporters now shouting bye bye. Uh, live on Square News, with his first reaction to the address by the Prime Minister. So, yes, we've got a new voice uh, in the House of Commons. Martin, what do you make of uh, Mr Galloway? Well, I've known George Galloway for many years, on and off. Um, and he's, he's inimitable. He means the, 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 the alliteration he got in there, diminished, diminutive, degraded. degraded. <laughs> and that's just came off the top it's of his poetic, head. It's poetic, isn't it? Actually, well, it's yeah. because he because he can think on his feet. Yeah, yeah it's and incredible. Then, can you imagine Keir Starmer or Rishi Sunak or Joe Biden coming up with a, a, a something like that just on the on the on the spur of the moment? Yeah. They can't do it. No, he is an amazing orator. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, and how, and how wooden did does Rishi Sunak sound in comparison? Well, that's you know, right. making that absurd speech. Um, at, trying to be the big man outside number 10. Uh, do you think that some, um, of that some of those speeches may be written by AI? I'm not... <laughs> could well be. I, I mean, but, uh, but uh, just bizarre, that, you know, Sunak's... That's Sunak's response to a, a by-election victory, you know, part of the, the democratic process, um, and, and making this ridiculous speech about the democracy, you know, being under threat. Um, it's ridiculous. What democracy un is under threat by is, I think, by the two major parties and the mm. um, the tw two party system, as Galloway always says, two cheeks of the same backside, which you know, in other another term is Team A and Team B. And it seems like Team A are rather worn out, so it's time for Team B in the general election this year. But Galloway is also very incisive about uh, the Israel lobby here in Britain, and particularly about Labour friends of Israel. But both the Speaker and the Deputy Speaker last night, who presided over this shambles, were both members of the Labour Friends of Israel. I call them the Labour Fiends of Israel. It's just a misprint. I just dropped the R. The Labour Fiends of Israel. How does it happen by chance that both the Speaker and the Deputy Speaker 
in charge of that chaos were both members of the Labour Friends of Israel. Why does Israel have so many friends in the Labour Party? Yeah. Why? They're not friends of Zimbabwe or friends of Turkmenistan. They're all friends of Israel. Why? What is it that they find so particularly attractive about an apartheid state that's on trial for genocide? Not one of them has resigned. Not one member of the Labour Friends of Israel has resigned for the last 130 days. I want, you know, Paul Daniels, uh, she died. Debbie McGee. Debbie McGee. Debbie, ask Mrs. Paul Daniels. Thank you. You're welcome. What first attracted you to the multi millionaire Paul Daniels? It was one of the most devastating questions ever asked on television. And I would like to ask these labor fiends of Israel, what first attracted you uh, to this state 2,500 miles away of 6 million people? And you're endlessly going there. They're donating large amounts of money into your election campaigns, into your political party. Keir Starmer has had hundreds of thousands of pounds from the fiends of Israel. And unless you know, you don't know. I know, and you know now, because I just told you, you all probably, many of you already knew, but the mass of the public don't know. They think that Keir Starmer is saying what he's saying uh, because he believes it, but I know that that isn't true. Because I stood in a room listening to a speech by the same Keir Starmer in 2015, ancient history I know, <laughs> nine years ago, I was there, saw his lips move as he made a speech calling for Israel to be kicked out of the football association, FIFA, because they were a racist apartheid state. Imagine, in nine years, he's gone from wanting to kick Israel out of football to being Israel's biggest supporter anywhere in the world. I wonder what happened on that road to Damascus. Thank you. <laughs> So, Martin, this is uh, quite clearly massive in the United States and here too. Uh, the Labour and the Conservative Friends of Israel uh, taking vast amounts of money from the Israeli state, which is actually most of it just coming from the United States, big grants to Israel, uh, in order to help their election expenses. But uh, this is obviously affecting the way they're voting on these issues. Well, if you think about the Labour MPs in Bristol, Fangham Debonair, Darren Jones and Karen Smith are all Labour friends of Israel. I understand that Kerry McCarthy is not. And you, and as, as Sir George Galloway points out, why are they friends of Israel? Why aren't they friends of Palestine, for example? You'd expect lots of Labour MPs to be Palestine solidarity supporters. Why aren't they? Uh, well, you didn't mention uh, Damien Egan, who is the MP for Kingswood, new, oh. new Labour MP And he's Kingswood. also a Labour friend of Israel and, <clears throat> and married to an ex-Israeli uh, spook. Yeah, Yossi Felderbaum right. is his husband. Uh, and as we said last week, uh, I'll share it again this week, uh, some bright spark at the Electronic Intifada has drunk, uh, dug up his CV and his work history. Quite clearly, he's worked for six years for this thing called U Unit 8200, Unit 8200, which is the Israeli equivalent of GCHQ. And there is a picture of him there. Uh, next to the Clifton Suspension Bridge. So uh, we have uh, a penetration of the British political process by Israeli spies. Well, that's clear. I mean, the, the Al Jazeera sting on uh, the uh, Shai Mof, Mossad, Moffat, was it? Yeah. The, uh, the, the, uh, the Mossad agent who was approaching uh, the Labour MP, I can't remember her name, Joan somebody or other, she was actually le left the Labour Party, resigned at one stage, because it was going under the Corbyn uh, regime, as it were, and now she's back in, in, in the good books and all the rest of it. Um, you know, it, I mean, it's becoming very clear that one of the, the, the third, the electrified rail for Corbyn was this whole question of Israel-Palestine. Yeah. They, they didn't like anything that it was standing for, but that was the one that really got them going. Because, of course, 
Britain's role in the creation of the State of Israel is fundamental. And if Britain was to decide that it no longer, you know, and of course British public opinion is still quite hostile to mainstream Israeli opinion. There's a big gap there. And, and that's not represented in our political process at all, is it? And, uh, you know, this is, we, we are also potentially the weakest link, I would suggest, because I don't know anybody who's in favour of the, the RAF bombing Yemen from Akrotiri and Cyprus. And then maybe I'll ring moving the uh, wrong well, circles. I mean, uh, having, but what uh, business is it of ours having, to bomb Yemen from I mean, ha Having done documentary, a documentary in the past with RAF pilots um, during the time of the first Gulf War, uh, they were quite, uh, off the record, quite um, adamant with me that they hated doing it. They really felt that this was something that they... Um, and they were also blowing the whistle on some of the lies about the smart bombs, the smart technology, telling me that uh, although they make out that these bombs uh, can't miss, actually quite often things go wrong and the bombs just go haywire and go anywhere and maybe uh, hit a market square instead of the target that they're supposed to be hitting. But at the ultimate, uh, the, the um, political masters behind the Royal Air Force don't really give a fig for this. So, I mean, we, 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 we uh, rather than um, uh, focusing on Gaza this way, there's all sorts going on there, but um, it, since you're just back uh, from the UAE, uh, uh, Judith, what about other Arab countries? Um, do they, do, do some support Yemen? Do some not support? And of course we've got the Gulf states, which are these little kind of yeah. tiny little places yeah. as well. So I, I think the majority of the people in Yemeni countries um, support um, Gaza and are against the, what's happening now. And there are, there are some countries that um, where politically the leaders are also um, uh, supporting Palestine. What about somebody like Saudi Arabia? Because I mean, there's it's supposed to be an Arab country. Yeah. But yeah, Saudi Arabia is quite interesting. They, they have these things called the Abraham Accords. Um, I think they, they use the name Abraham because in, in um, Muslim... Uh, in Islam, they have uh, Ibrahim, and it's the same person. So they called it the Abraham Accords because it's a link between Jews and Muslims. Um, so uh, UAE was the very first person to sign, followed by Bahrain. Then... Um, Sudan signed. You see, it's, people are all being bribed to sign. You were talking about money to support politicians, but money also. For example, um, uh, uh, Sudan had its debt wiped off and was also taken off the terrorist list. Um, Morocco signed, but in return for signing uh, for si uh, for signing the accords, uh, it was said that they could now um, control the area that they've been occupying for almost as long as Israel's been in, been occupied. Palestine, the um, uh, Western Sahara. So, so that's now part of Morocco. Di so diplomatic deals being cut behind yeah, the scenes. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So therefore, people are being bribed in order to sign to sign the accords. Um, uh, uh, they're, they're, uh, most people have heard that Egypt has said that it, uh, they've told Egypt that they would wipe its debt off. It's already um, uh, 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 has diplomatic relations with with Israel um, if it, if it uh, accepts. Uh, um, refugees from Gaza and people seem to think that they are actually preparing to take some um, Gazan refugees there um, but uh, that's that's speculation but I suspect that it might happen so um, so people are being sort of like um, bribed with with sort of like large sums of money I think UAE is um, is uh, has colonialist ambitions of its own and therefore it fits in very well with um, with with, um, with Israel and um, and then um, Bahrain is just the, the leaders are sort of like a very nasty bunch and um, and uh, so so they they fit in and didn't need bribing but um, but all the time they're trying to find reasons to get sort of countries to sign. Some countries have definitely said that they won't. I mean, obviously you've got the um, you've got Syria, but Saudi was um, was just about to sign um, mm. uh, the uh, the Abraham Accords, and uh, uh, when in fact the uh, the Gaza war broke out. So let's, let's just make it clear: this signing. Abraham Ibrahim Accords is yeah. between Israel and Arab states. Yes. 
Yeah, okay. Yeah. What about uh, the Houthis? What are they actually saying about why they're doing what they're doing? Well, they've made it quite plain that uh, that the reason why they're doing it is until the Gazans get adequate food and, and nutrition. And we, we keep hearing from our own politicians that, that, that this is not the reason, uh, that, you know, this is nothing to do with Gaza, but, but this is not what the Houthis are saying. No, it isn't. They're making it quite plain. And they've said that as soon as... that well, They've actually uh, said um, medical aid, um, food, food and water and as soon as the the people in gaza have sufficient then they're going to uh, allow um uh, ships to go through the bab al mandab they've made it absolutely clear there's there's absolutely no doubt that that is what what they're what they're saying martin isn't it absolutely obvious that if you're a shipping company you want to avoid the red sea really uh, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter actually even if you're you think you're safe it's not a great place to be if you if you've got a container ship well, I think this is the this is the idiocy of the so-called Operation Prosperity Guardian, which oh, the yeah. British and the Americans signed up for, and Australia, New Zealand, Bahrain, and a few others hanging around in the background, Canada. I mean, no, no, <coughs> the only Arab state which said it was part of this coalition was Bahrain, as you say, yeah. and that's because the Al Khalifa family are Sunni thugs basically put in yeah, power absolutely. by the british in the 19th century yeah, and they dominate the sheer majority in bahrain yeah. so when there was a in, during the arab spring the people in bahrain rose up against the al khalifa family the saudis actually put, sent their army into bahrain uh, to support the al khalifa family and that's where the us sixth fleet is based so nobody else including the uae or saudi arabia supports britain and and, uh, uh, and and the US I mean, in taking on the South. Let's, let's just go on back the a second to, the, to Rishi Sunak's speech last Friday because he was talking about uh, how dare people say that Britain's been on the wrong side of history. Because actually what you're saying there is that actually the Brits have caused much of this. Well, there's a very good book by Caroline Elkins, who's a, a US academic, which has come out a couple of years ago. I can, you can look it up on the computer if people are interested. Uh, it's about the British Empire. And it's basically about how bloodthirsty it was. As, as, as a Brit and a, and a patriotic English person, I would say, I do not want to hide for a second from the things my country has done. Why not? We can, ta- we can take it. We know who we are. We know what we've done. And because of that history, we've got quite a radical tradition as well. We're opposed to this sort of stuff. We fought two world wars to stop it. The State of Israel was created by us and, the, and was in, through the Balfour Declaration and, and the recognition of the State of Israel in 1948. And therefore, we've got responsibility for it. And, and it's, no, it's no saying we've got no responsibility for it. Of course, it's our responsibility, and, isn't it? And of course, that was anti-Semitic in its, in, in, in its way as well, because no countries in Europe nor America would take the refugees from the Holocaust, and so that then they were forced to place them into somebody else's country. That, well, that's right. I mean, yeah. in actual fact, the you Zionist lobby in the US, second. can I just pick up on this? On. The Zionist lobby in the US, most re- Jewish refugees in, in Europe at the end of the war wanted to go to the United States. It's they obvious, did. obvious place for them to go, and because it was a you know, prosperous country, got an established Jewish community, and uh, they were told by the Americans because they were lobbied by the Zionist lobby that they couldn't take them. For Roosevelt was in favour of taking them. He said, "Okay, we can take that. Why not? They'll fit in." But no, they all had to go to Israel because that's what the Israelis claim. The, the Jews can only go to Israel. It's the only safe place in the world well, for them and so on and so forth. Caroline so Elkins, Zert. Martin, you were mentioning there, has obviously found her niche. Uh, she started off uh, with, in 2006, this book, Imperial Reckoning, the untold story of Britain's gulag in Kenya. Yes, it's a very good book. It's about what happened in Kenya. <clears throat> and in fact, you were talking about uh, Frank Kitson last week, weren't yes, you? Yes, he died in January. And the death of Kitson. I mean, he's he's the uh, author of the two books that i know of one is called um the ca- gangs and counter gangs the other is uh, low intensity operations low intensity operation. so these are both ways to fight kind of guerrilla wars but by infiltrating the in fact it started controlling uh, the opposition to the imperial power in this case britain uh, and also extreme ruthlessness. So in a way, it's almost like what was going on with the IRA and steak knife, and we haven't really talked about that this week much, but this is a big today, particularly in the news, is the way that the British Army were actually controlling uh, the nutting squad in the IRA. This is, in a, in a way, straight out of... Uh, it's straight out uh, of the of kitchen his, playbook. Yeah. yeah. 
I mean, he's very, he's very influential, not just on British counterinsurgency operations, but also American, Israeli counterinsurgency. And when you say it's counterinsurgency, that's, that's to put two, that's to sort of, what, what he used to do in Kenya and what the seller scouts used to do in Rhodesia is they would dress up as Mau Mau and then go out and kill people. So that people got the idea that the Maui went around killing loads of people. Then they put, then they created a massive prison camp system, which, uh, which virtually one and a half million people were put through these prison camps, out of which, as Caroline Elkin showed, at least 200,000 people died in those camps. So there were more people in prison in Kenya as political prisoners at that time than in, than in the Soviet Union. And these were death camps. They killed a lot of people. And, and nobody was ever punished for any of it. It's in contrast to the British in Yemen, because we uh, interviewed, or I interviewed a couple of years ago, Kevin Carhill, who was a soldier in Yemen, and he said, well, basically, as soon as the things started blowing up, they pulled out. There was hardly any casualties on, on uh, uh, well, there were quite a few casualties on um, uh, the, the, the first few weeks, but the British pulled out almost as soon as things started kicking off in Yemen. But in Kenya, uh, they decided they were going to do everything they could to hang on to that. Why do you think that was? Well, well, in Kenya, you've got, you had a very well-established, very wealthy, aristocratic, white farming elite. When I say they were farmers, yeah. they didn't do much farming, but they owned a lot of the land. Yeah. And therefore, they, you know, they, they had a lot of pull in Britain itself. Kenya in terms is a very of strategic place as well, isn't it? Because, you know, it's all very well to control a few countries around the edge well, of Africa. Yemen, but... Yemen is even more strategic. Yes, Yemen, Yemen is, is the but most strategically placed country in the world. And yes, that's I mean, uh, and the reason yeah. why they pulled out, is a Brit Labour government that pulled out in 1967, is because we've no, we, the, Yemen was originally, or Aden was originally important, because it was a coaling station to go to, to go on the way to India, which was the real jewel in the crown yeah, of the British yeah. Empire. So, but once Br India had become independent, there was no point in Britain hanging on to Ah, so, yeah. yes, okay, yeah. makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? The other book that she's done more recently is called Legacy of Violence, uh, A History of the British Empire. So I'll put that's, links, the one, that's the one I was talking about. It's a relatively recent book. Uh, up to those both on our show page at thisweek.org.uk. A book that Rishi Sunak should read in his retirement. Well, yes, but it's not going to go in. It's almost well, he like comes you can from East say Africa himself. You, his can family are East to, you can say stuff to these people and they could read it, but it's not actually going to go in because they're not interested. Their brain doesn't work like this. It's almost like you could wave something in front of Sunak next face your hand in front of his face and it would be totally blank uh, anyway let's get back to yemen we had a bit of a yeah. tangent there yeah. uh, what about the global effect of all of this is this really ha having a big effect well, on global trade and it, policy and it and, is yeah. it has having an effect because what's happening is that um a lot, they're saying that overall shipping the, the, sh the movement of ships in the world is actually increased by 40%. So that you could say that adds a cost. But it's, what it's also what doing... Do you say movement? You see, does that mean it, miles travelled or something? Miles travelled, yeah, okay. yeah. It's actually increased by Isn't 40%. Isn't it an, an extra 3,000 miles or something? It's yeah, enormous, to go, to enormous, go ra right, right around the Cape, yeah. And... Um, and I suppose a lot of shipping c comes through the... That's quite a lot of diesel. Well. It is. But it's not just the cost. What's happening is that those ships are at sea for much longer. So it's actually meaning that there's not enough ships to sort of move goods that need to be moved as well because it's tying up shipping by them. Well, that's handy much because we've journeys. got a recession. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. What about the, the... You were talking a bit about the weapons um, that the Yemenis are using. Are they really weapons that the Yemenis are managing? Manufacturing themselves. Yeah, they're manufacturing themselves. They're cheap and they're, uh, but they're not. They're, but they're quite sophisticated, um, and uh, and they they've designed them themselves. They're um, they're producing them themselves. They're doing, they're completely sovereign in terms of their weapons. Do you know uh, how successful the British and American strikes have been in stopping? And and have they? You know, they've they've been really surgical in trying to take out the places well, where these are being fired from or manufactured from. Well, app apparently not. <coughs> they have been attacking sites around Yemen that they think are um, manufacturing weapons, but uh, the Yemenis haven't said that they've attacked any major structures. But in terms of sort of like the um, the firing pads for the for the missiles, they're all mobile, so therefore they fire them and move them. Mm. So therefore, they're very difficult for them to track and um, and and and, uh, and and bomb those particular. Well, I mean, sites. this is obviously one on the n in the n in the. F <laughs> 
on the nose, maybe. Yes, yeah. yeah, a punch in the face, really, for the West. But what about the effect uh, on the South, the BRICS countries, the al- you know the alternative? This is a growing. Uh, it a- is a growing. Yeah. I think that what it's doing is giving more confidence to the South because what you're seeing happening now is not only Yemen is n- isn't afraid of America and UK. In fact, most people in America in Yemen dur- in the north of Yemen during the war thought that they were fighting um, uh, uh, that Saudi was fight was it was a proxy war with Saudi fighting on behalf of UK and USA, um, and and uh, so therefore they've they've lost their fear of America. But not only the um, uh, Yemen have lost their fear, but also a lot of other countries are like you see the South Africa taking uh, um, uh, countries to the uh, uh, International Court of Justice. Um, not only have they taken Israel, but they're now taking uh, plans to take um, UK and and USA good, as accessories. Good. I, as a patriotic yeah. Brit, say brilliant. Yes, let's let's get our government in the dock yeah. and send them to jail yeah. uh, for genocide. So what about um, uh, the fact-checking? Because you, you, you often come in and talk about yeah. fact-checking. Yeah. Gaza and Yemen are two yeah. big topics that I imagine the yeah. likes of Google, uh, people sitting there with their algorithms, are going to be trying to steer us down yeah. a rabbit hole somewhere. Indeed. That- I think the fact-checkers are doing much the same as the mainstream media. But I think what's quite interesting about the mainstream media, I, I, um, there is a story because uh, that, that came out this week. Um, a, a story was published in the New, New York Times in the middle of December um, about the uh, the rapes in uh, the alleged rapes by Hamas in uh, on October the seventh, and apparently the staff of the New York Times felt that the story that uh, hadn't been verified, and they checked these um, the the beds this this I think they're called grade four beds or something and these uh, beds in israeli hospitals that are uh, so that all uh, people have been um, attacked uh, with um, sexually um, go into these beds and none of them had been occupied after after the 7th of october they also checked with the rape, rape uh, the crisis center the rape crisis center in israel there were no cases they also went to this center which was um, giving uh, holistic care to the to the survivors of the rave where 200 people had been killed and they said that no one had reported any sexual violence and also in the Israeli newspapers um, they're, they're saying that the, for example newspapers like the Times of Israel quite conservative newspapers in Israel are actually saying that there's no forensic evidence of rape so taking this all together I think the staff of the New York Times had been in dispute with the, ed- with the editor- editors and wanted to with, with to uh, withdraw the story which the editors had refused to do and last week they went to the intercept with the evidence that this story was uh, w- hadn't been verified and yet the New York Times I th- think this is more interesting than the story because I haven't heard of any staff in a newspaper and they must be doing it together because otherwise they wouldn't have confidence in doing it um, of actually going against the story on um, that, that favours Israel being published yeah. in a newspaper and have actually uh, whistleblown on the fact that the newspaper is publishing uh, well, stories that I mean, aren't verified. This, this is sort of mind blowing in yeah, a way, isn't it? Is. it? Yeah. Because what you've got is uh, um, the facts are not being checked by yeah. the New York yeah. Times, and so people don't trust what they're reading, yeah. and so therefore they've got to set up this whole network of fact checkers. Yeah. But the fact checkers don't check the facts which are wrong. No, so, no they, they check. They check the facts that don't that don't concur with the narrative that powers wish people to hear and uh, I've been checking well, AFP which is the biggest fact check group in the world to see how they've covered the conflict it's quite is that, is that Agent France Press or what? Yes, something it to is. do with them yeah. it's their own yeah, one they're, 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 they're huge into fact checking right. they've got um, they've got fact checking uh, platforms in most countries in the world um, several in some countries they're huge they're easily the biggest fact check group there's no other fact check group that comes anywhere near the size of AFP so I checked um, the first three months after um, from the 7th of October until the um, 6th of January six months their fact checks they had 140 
in line with many fact checks, um, well over a third were trivia, um, like how many people attended a rally, um, what uh, some celebrity said about Gaza, so sort of absolutely minor things. But then when you look at the ones that were actually about the Gaza war themselves, I think there were 84 fact checks out of 140 that were actually about the war itself. But if you looked at those, a lot of the, those were sort of like really fringe issues and uh, and they, they, they were criticized criticizing the, the Palestinian story, not the Israeli story. So, for example, they didn't, they said things like, oh, um, this, this bit of clip, which was meant to come from Gaza, we found that it came from Syria or, um, or, or an earlier war or something like that. This was a, pal this was an actor acting the part. So these were all sort of like fringe issues and they didn't look at any really core issues. Like, for example, the, the allegations that have been, uh, disproved that, uh, that were, uh, that were linked to the Israeli narrative, things like the beheaded babies, for example, um, um, things like the the rapes. That they, they didn't look at those issues, and they haven't looked. They haven't looked at any sort of issues that the Palestinians have raised. So they are only fact checking, really, on behalf of the Israeli lobby. Okay, so who funds the fact checkers? Now, the fact checkers are all funded by the extremely wealthy um, countries. Um, uh, especially in your, in Europe and America, um, EU, um, they're funded by wealthy philanthropists. European and American philanthropists. They're funded by large corporations such as Google and Meta. Um, so if you like, all of the fact-checking industry, which probably amounts to sort of like billions rather than, rather than millions uh, per year, um, is actually funded by the this, this, this stinking rich and the powerful. Martin, yeah. Uh, yeah. there's something a bit Orwellian about this, isn't there? Because yeah. you've got these people sitting in their high towers, the uh, the top floor of the media corporation, people like Mr Murdoch, etc. And they're saying, hey, look, we're, we're getting these surveys back saying people don't trust us anymore. So we're going to have to sh set up fact check. Uh, um, we're going to have to get these fact check people so that people will think that, that, that this being fact checked. But... Uh, and that will make them trust us more. But actually, this is really just a, a kind of uh, sticky plaster over the problem. And I wonder what you make of it, because it, it's almost as if they're not interested in actually getting the facts right. They just want to have some sort of illusionary appearance of uh, getting uh, the facts right to affect the the mindset of the person reading it, not the actual um, the balanced journalism and the facts themselves. Well, I th it's not a sticking plaster it's actually part of the disinformation campaign by the powerful. Mm. You know, fact-checking, as described by, by, uh, by our colleague here, is, is, exactly like, is exactly that. It's part of the wall of lies and disinformation. And, of course, most people are unaware of the existence of these organisations. They're only probably f heard about by people who read quality newspapers and so on. People who read The Sun don't bother about fact-checking, you know. They know it's a load of rubbish when they're reading it. And so when they have... Uh, the reader or the viewer has some doubts uh, we're told oh okay you can scan this qr code and you can find out what the uh, f the fact checkers say about this uh I, it's almost i get to i'm getting to the point where i start thinking well if something's been fact checked um then it's probably true i think if something's been fact checked it's probably exactly what the those in power want you to know <laughs> yeah, and it's not. It's not. It's, they don't check. They don't check. They don't do proper fact checking. And of course, the, what the journalists used to check their own facts. That's what you're supposed <laughs> that's to what do. We all used yeah. to that's do. In the, yeah. That's in the job. Yes. Well, some check. of us try to do it all the time. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, look, um, the this particular uh, New York Times story, I think, you know, it's interesting. In yeah, that it is indeed. What's happened is uh, you've basically got some sort of uh, Israeli. Um, Israeli Defence Force press release, a bu bunch of text that's just been cut and pasted into the New York Times paper and website yeah. without being properly checked. Um, and the same sort of thing has been going on, um, exactly same sort of thing, on the same day, whatever it was about, I think it was about six or eight weeks ago, when the International Court of Justice announced their verdict on 
uh, the Israeli genocide. Well, what they were saying is that we don't yet believe that this is a genocide, but the Israelis are on notice that they must make sure that they don't commit any genocide. We will be watching. And so this is an ongoing process. They're now monitoring it, the International Court of Justice, and there may well be a judgment that it is genocide under the Genocide Convention. Yeah. But this was a, a, a PR blow for them. Yeah. And so on the same day, the Israelis released this what I would call toxic press release about UNRWA, which is mm. United Nations uh, Works, relief, uh, Works relief, and relief and Work yeah. Agency, yeah. Um, having Hamas fighters from the 7th of October working for them. Well, uh, there was apparently 12 people who'd been involved in the, this is according to the Israelis. And again, this wasn't fact checked. This no, was just um, cut and pasted yeah. into the news of the world yeah. and into the minds of the, the people in the Western world. Other parts of the world, of course, did fact check it. Yeah. But, uh, so I thought we'd have a little look now at that because the effect of, um, cutting as so many countries did. First of all, it was the Five Eyes countries. So obviously Israel is already not supporting <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but you've also then got because that's the sixth of the five eyes you've got you britain the united states canada australia and new zealand they all stopped funding the un aid agency in gaza and then we had uh, roughly half of the nato countries yeah. they also stopped funding yeah. so this is quite obviously nothing to do with whether there's some sort of terrorist in unra it's just doing what the israelis mm. wanted them to do well, what I think is, if if there were any UNRWA people in that um, in that uh, uh, attack, um, uh, and uh, I think the attack itself uh, probably was illegal, um, and well, it was illegal, but the, it was illegal in the sense that it was a crime, and therefore people should have been um, the individual members should have been sought out and then um, given a prison sentence. So if they've got the names of 12 UNRWA people, I've heard seven, but uh, you, you've heard, t heard, heard um, 12, but uh, if they've got the names of those people, they should take them to the Israeli court, and if they uh, are able to conclude that they did kill and attack uh, Israeli civilians, then they should serve a si well, prison the, sentence. The point is that these but, are allegations against yeah, these Only people. allegations. They need to be they need to be proved in court but that is but to stop the funding to unra at a time of of a potential genocide is act is is actually appalling it's there's, there's nothing else can be said about yeah, it well it's yeah. um, the, the fact is that they have done that they've mm. uh, and they still haven't been funding unra although david cameron says we now have a plan to resume funding unra uh, mm. that doesn't mean to say he's going to start funding them again yeah. and and this is really uh, piling misery upon misery and genocide yeah. upon genocide yeah. by now continuing to starve these people and um, of course they're dying at a rate of knots so uh, also looking at this this whole situation with getting aid in um, and even if UNRWA is working I think it's also quite important to say uh, that UNRWA has 12,000 employees so what they're alleging is 12 of those may have been involved yeah. uh, there are other estimates of 24,000 because it has all these peripheral organisations yeah, exactly. helping UNRWA yeah. Yeah. so you're talking here about one in two thousand people in this organization yeah. uh, potentially being involved allegedly being involved and you haven't investigated it but you're going to cut the funding anyway uh, and of course that's going to mean people yeah. dying yeah. Uh, uh, possibly thousands of people dying because they're not getting aid anymore but i thought it, it very important and, and useful to look at this this uh, chap organi and I, I can't remember his name because it's like organic food or whatever but he's got the c missing off the end and there was a report uh, uh, this week about uh, this uh, Egyptian guy and we heard this a couple of weeks ago from Vanessa Bealey over in Damascus mm. and I've followed it up and here's a report about the plight of Palestinians which was reported really good report actually on Sky uh, on Sky TV and what about it Rafa on the border with Egypt no one wants to be here but there is a way out it comes though at a vast cost Sky News can reveal how one Egyptian company controls the only commercial crossing out of Gaza, and it's now charging Palestinians $5,000 to leave. We were shocked with, with the prices, absolutely out of our league. It's just too expensive. God willing, the price will go down. Our investigation, based on the testimony of more than 70 Palestinians and analysis of documents and videos, shows it's increased its fees 14-fold since the start of the war, recently earning more than a million dollars per day. 
Former industry insiders have called it criminal extortion. It leaves Palestinians with an impossible choice. Come up with a vast sum or stay in Rafa and wait as Israel prepares its final ground assault. But over time, the number of companies offering this service has decreased, meaning there's now only one player in the game, Hala. Light music and a glossy promo is more like an ad for a last-minute holiday. It's actually a Hala advert for border crossings, and it looks easy and straightforward in this video from before the war. Palestinians in Gaza have long been used to paying fees to expedite their travel across the border. Hala has been the dominant player in this industry since 2019, when it began offering its VIP service, as shown in this video. We found a Facebook page with Hala employees offering advice. We spoke to one whose name we've redacted. We asked how much it was to leave Gaza for an adult and child. They came back to us, $5,000. We asked if they worked for Hala and how we would transfer the money. They said they did and told us we could pay by mobile cash transfer and send a relative to their headquarters in Cairo. We then asked if they lived in Cairo. And crucially, how could we be safe in the knowledge this wasn't a scam? They said they'd send us a photo of the ticket. We asked how long it would take to get names on the list. From one to ten days, they said. This is what a travel ticket looks like, as provided by the employee as proof of their wares. So this Hala employer has told us that if you want guaranteed exit from Rafa, they are the people to go to. They told us to go to their offices in Nasser City in Cairo. Well, this is what people find when they do go. Hundreds queuing outside Hala's Cairo offices for a chance to get their loved ones on a future travel list. Multiple sources told Sky News there are often hundreds or even thousands of people queuing. And two sources said they were forced to pay a non-refundable $1,000 deposit simply to get into the building. Based on social media posts and the testimony of dozens of people who've arranged travel with Halla since October the 7th, Sky News was able to piece together a clear picture of how the company operates. Tickets used to cost in the region of $350, around £280 before the war. But Halla price lists show people are now looking at $5,000 per person to guarantee a way out, and $2,500 for children. Passenger lists are released daily, sometimes pictures taken of paper sheets posted on social media. On average, 235 people travel a day. Some passengers with Egyptian nationality pay a lower fare. But Sky News' analysis of Hala crossing lists and prices shows that on a day with few Egyptian passengers, the company can earn in excess of $1 million. Well, well done, Sky News, uh, putting that report together. Uh, thanks for Vanessa Beely for tipping this show off about it. And it's not just that. Uh, I noticed the Middle East Eye has just done a report on the Israel-Palestine war. They're saying uh, war on Gaza. Charity says Egypt intelligence-linked firm is charging $5,000 to get aid over the border. Uh, the NGO provided Middle East Eye with first testimony that indicates Egyptian officials are profiteering from uh, the genocide in Gaza. Uh, an international charity with extensive experience in providing emergency aid in wars, famines and earthquakes throughout the Middle East and Afghanistan is being forced to pay £5,000 per lorry in a, co a company linked to Egypt's General Intelligence Service, the GIS, to get aid into Gaza. Uh, the charity said the money is being paid in the form of a management fee to a company affiliated with the Soros of Sinai, a construction and contracting firm owned by the Sinai businessman Ibrahim al organi so uh, this uh, martin this is pretty appalling isn't it i mean you know the idea that uh, suddenly because we can control the border hey there's more demand for people to get across the border so let's jack the price up if i can just intercept yeah. one other little thing yeah. there i was listening to um a doctor who'd been he was an american doctor who'd been working in gaza and he said that they have to pay the money uh, the charities that they're wake, working for have to pay the money for them to come out to. so when you're donating to one of the Palestine charities mm -hmm. or medical charities, that money may be going straight into Ibrahim al organis yes, exactly. uh, bank account yeah. in, in Egypt. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, this this kind of war profiteering is sadly not uh, unusual. 
It's the sort when, of thing that goes on. When people say on. no one wants a war, obviously Ibrahim al Organi does. Well, that's right. And of course, the, you, it's, it's writ even larger when we're talking about Raytheon and, uh, and British Aerospace and all these other people are breaking it in. And of course, that means the people, the, the shareholders of these companies, which are the great and the good. I bet you Rishi's got a few shares in all of that stuff. Indeed. And uh, when, when, when Theresa May uh, agreed to carry out uh, uh, attacks from Akrotiri in Cyprus into Syria, yeah? Uh, after the so-called Duma chemical weapons attack has been largely debunked by, by serious investigation, um, her, f her husband is a hedge fund manager, and he, uh, because he, you know, they had some pillow talk the night before it happened, he uh, made some moves on the stock market that morning and made a killing. Because, of course, if you know that the British are going to attack Syria and that's going to affect the price of Raytheon shares, you can, you can buy some shares before the price goes it, up do we, do and you know, sell them and make a bit of money, any more which is exactly what he did. Who made the money just after the 7th of October attacks? Cause oh, there yes, was some, stock, stock somebody market. did make money, didn't they? They bet... You know, you can tell that something's going on when it was in Israel, it was in Israel itself, wasn't it? People actually bet on companies which, bet, which either went down or up. And it was, you know, you can, you can, and therefore the, the, that implies foreknowledge of the attack, mm. does it not? Mm. As has happened in many of these yes. incidents. Yeah. Which then goes to show there's more to going on here than meets the eye. Can I just make one point about UNRWA before we move on? What is that? What that involves is taxpayers like me in Britain and around the world, in 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 in, in, in France and everywhere else that funds UNRWA. We are funding the Israelis to drive the Palestinians off their own land, and then they've been put into into camps in Jordan and in Syria, and we are then paying to keep those. And the Israelis don't pay a penny towards any of this. We pay for their mess. Yeah, and I think, I think Nigel Farage needs to be told about this. Why is taxpayers, British taxpayers' money being spent in this way? Huh? So as the Israelis can, can go on the yeah, rampage. Because it, it, in, ter in terms of the people who are occupied in Gaza and West Bank, um, th th they are actually meant to be completely funded by Israel. I don't know, once they're refugees out of the con outside the country, I don't know whether that's true. Well, I mean, but certainly if they're occupied, they're meant to pay all of the expenses, the living well, expenses. But it, it means the that they're in a position to switch it all off, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And of course they do. If it suits them. Let's and just be clear about the stock trading around the 7th of October. The, what we would probably just call insider dealing uh, bets against the value of Israeli companies. This is CNN spiked in the days before the October the 7th Hamas attacks, suggesting traders may have had advanced knowledge of the terror attack and profited off of it, according to research released uh, this preliminary research. Uh, from law professors at Columbia University and New York University, details a significant and unusual spike five days before the attacks in short selling the most popular fund uh, linked to Israeli companies. Short selling is a way to bet against the value or security. Mm. Well, that's right. I mean, the, and the, this this implies. I mean, we've been discussing this week after week, and of course, this is what knocked this Labour candidate out of the Rochdale the by election. By the way, was in a Israelis, private conversation uh, talking about let's this. Let's be balanced here because claims traders profited from attack are inaccurate, says Israel. Well, they do say things like that, don't they? And they're very good at just the the, the, the Hasbara you know, psychological warfare aspect of what the Israelis do is you'd, you'd think that they would just give up on telling fibs, but they, they don't. Because I, in actual fact, if you tell enough fibs, yeah. it, has an, it has an impact. You know, a, fi a fib, like we just deny it all, is, is, is good enough to keep most people quiet. And of course, it, unless you've got the time and the inclination to unpick it all, it, it works very well. That's why they, that's why they do it. Absolutely, it does. Uh, yeah. Airdropped aid has crushed five to death in Gaza. So this great idea of dropping aid from aircraft, which I was quite an advocate of, obviously it's got to be done carefully and properly, but no, apparently the aid from parachutes from aircraft was dropped on top of people and killed five of them. Um, and also the port in Gaza for aid. What do you make of that, Judith, this concept of having a port on the Mediterranean to bring aid into Gaza? Well, why not? I mean, it's, it's absolutely logical that uh, that Gaza doesn't have its own airport and port. Um, it it did have uh, paid for by the EU when um, when they were saying that they were going to give um, Palestine independence and it was going to be Gaza and Jericho first. Um, so, uh, it, it, why shouldn't it have its own port? It's it's logical that it doesn't. 
Uh, yeah, the only thing is, of course, it might be US and Israeli controlled aid. Uh, and we saw it with the flower uh, massacre last week. Uh, what can happen yeah. if the Israelis are, are left in control of the aid? Then they yeah. sort of basically, this is almost like um, a trap. So here's the aid, everybody. And as people start to gather, they wait until the highest concentration of Palestinians are there. And, and then, then they open sh- up with machine guns. And shoot them. I know. It's just um, appalling. So and then apparently, or they say that ordinary Israeli citizens have seen films of it um uh, are actually stopping aid from entering um gaza f- acro- through places like the Eretz crossing as well so um so it's not getting in because it's being obstructed <coughs> by israeli citizens um so uh, netanyahu apparently is vowing to invade rafa he's rejecting all international pressure to do so um, and another re- another report, Israel has set March the 15th as a deadline for its broad war against Lebanon. So I don't know if he's got enough troops, enough soldiers to do both at the same time. Maybe he has, Martin. Uh, I think what they're playing for there is to drag the Americans in to support them and then we'll go along as well. Yeah, that's the whole idea. If they can extend the war, the right wing in Israel want the war extended so that they won't have to fight on their own. The Americans will have to c- come in and, and help them out. And of course, if the Americans go in and help them out, that, that means we are already helping them out. The yeah, British, we- the Royal Air Force is flying from Akrotiri. I looked this up the other day. I thought they must be flying over e- Israel. But in actual fact, the Egyptians are allowing British fl- aircraft to overfly Egypt. But of course, that won't be necessarily very popular amongst the Egyptian population. I mean, one of the things that might happen here, if Sisi was overthrown, that the Egyptian army might intervene against the Israelis. They're the big, they're the big, they're a big army. They've got the proper kit. But they, they could, they could probably but knock them back. Ve- but they're very pro-Israeli. Well, like, yes, I know the yeah. uh, Egyptian yeah. military. They're pro-US, yeah. yes. But yeah. that's not necessarily the people in the country, is no, it? No, not the people in the country. But I know that when, uh, when we were taking aid to, uh, to Gaza on a convoy, we went through Libya. Then when we got to Egypt, although we'd got permission to travel, the soldiers at the gate didn't let us through. They said, no. well, you've got, you've been given Against permission by policy. the government. The government aren't here. We are, and we're not letting you through. So I think the the uh, the military is being quite indoctrinated. Um, you're welcome to stay yeah. with us for a little while to talk yeah. about Ukraine if you want. That's up to you. Would you like to or not? I'm Judith? not. I'm no, not okay. incredibly up. Well, in the which Ukraine, case, so, uh, um, why not uh, just tell us about you? Apparently, starting a Substack next week. Yes, I week. am. Yes, everyone's um, doing this now. Yeah, everyone's starting a Substack. Um, yeah, I because I've because I've, I've got eyesight problems. So um, so I've got a, a PA coming to help me with starting up the Substack. And uh, so it's going to be called the Control of Information, Judith Substack, the Control of Information. So it's, I'm going to be hopefully publishing all of the research that I've done on fact-checking, um, uh, not only for um, for this subject, for a whole load of subjects. And, uh, and hopefully that will start going out next week okay well judith yeah. brown thanks ever so much for joining us once more um yeah. uh, what will it, it would just be called the control of information the control of information so yeah. we'll, we can we i can't put a link up to it yet folks no. but uh uh yeah anyway so thanks for all your help particularly on um the um uh on the fact checking stuff because i think for most of us we have no idea who these fact checkers are sometimes a big kind of screen appears uh, on your social media and it says oh this fact uh, these facts here have been checked are you sure you really want to have a look at this <laughs> yes. and of course this normally means that uh, someone is trying to stop you finding out what's going yeah, on exactly uh, yeah. anyway martin yeah. uh the first thing we're going to look yeah. at with ukraine uh, is thanks the british very much for having thanks me, judith um, uh is ten thousand british drones going to ukraine i didn't see that ten thousand british drones well it wouldn't surprise me i mean we're, we're in for a penny in for a pound aren't we on this uh, we, yeah, well, um, what do you, what do you, because a lot of this, um, the, the, is, is, the idea is that they're running out of, uh, Ukrainians. Well, they are running out of Ukrainians who are of but military a little robot, age and A so little battery powered robot. Well, the, the drone war has been relatively even compared to everything else. So Ukrainians have been able to use first person view drones. And, and also, of course, oh, what's they've got that? A first person, what's that? It's an FP, what we call an FPV drone, first person view drone. In other words, a little drone that you can, that somebody's flying as if it, as if they were in a computer game. Yeah. They're sitting on a console, moving it around, looking for, you know, that, and that, that, that has actually been one of the interesting things, if you're interested in these things about the Ukraine war, is how uh, important this kind of 
low level modern technology has become because a first person view drone can knock out a tank okay we've got a couple of stories tanks to do cost millions Ukraine. and millions of dollars first of all a russian warship has been destroyed it was only launched in 2022 this week uh, but first let's hear about zelensky g- giving a speech uh, in odessa only to find that the russians are blowing up buildings around him Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis was on a mission to show his country's support for Ukraine on a tour of the port city of Odessa. But the leader got a taste of war firsthand when a Russian drone hit a target just a few hundred meters away. We heard some sirens, and shortly after, as we were getting into our cars, we heard a big explosion. I think that for us, this is the best, most vivid reminder that there is a real war going on here. Every day there is war, which not only affects the front line, it affects our innocent fellow citizens. Russia says Wednesday's deadly strike hit a hangar housing Ukrainian naval drones. It's the latest attack on Kyiv's infrastructure on the Black Sea. It suffered a surge in Russian strikes since Moscow withdrew from a UN brokered deal last July that allowed the safe passage of Ukrainian grain shipments via the Black Sea. Russia claims Kyiv did its own damage on Wednesday. The governor of the Russian border region of Kurtz says a Ukrainian drone attacked a fuel depot there. Today, another attack on the Kurtz region was carried out by Ukraine. A drone attacked a fuel and lubricants warehouse. There are fires in the area right now. Operational services have rushed to the scene. In the northern region of Kharkiv, residents scrambled to pull a woman out from under rubble in the village of Borova, after it was hit by a Russian bomb, killing one person. The attacks come as the Ukrainian army continues to struggle to hold Russian forces back on the front line. A top Ukrainian commander vows that the situation on the battlefield will stabilize soon. He says the army aims to form units to carry out counter-offensive actions later this year. So, uh, yeah, that's an Al Jazeera report uh, on the uh, the uh, bombing in Odessa. So this is uh, the Russians saying, um, sending a message really to the press and to the Greek Prime Minister and to Zelensky. Well, the Russians themselves deny that they were targeting Zelensky as such. But, I mean, you can make of that what you will. Well, of course, I think it's obvious that they knew he was there. They knew he was giving a talk. He probably watching him on the TV and uh, saying, well, well let's, let's, um, let's at least show him that we, you know, we, can, we could kill him any time we want to, I guess. Well, I think that's been true all along. Uh, the Russians have generally taken the view that they're not going to kill the political leadership of the people they're fighting because they may have to talk to them. You know, the problem with killing the political leadership of the people you're fighting is then who are you going to talk to? But they, they, they've responded to, mili- uh, you know, what they would regard as terrorist attacks on Russian territory, like the the, the drone attacks and, uh, on, on Belgograd, which killed loads, uh, you know, a bunch of civilians, by attacking military infrastructure. This is why the Russians have insisted this is a special military operation, not a war. Because in a war, they'd just go all out and kill the other side up without without mercy. But they're not doing that. They're, go, they're going strictly for military targets, and, of course, some civilians are inevitably caught up in that. Uh, but I, they're not deliberately targeting civilians or the political leadership. The military leadership, they, have, they are targeting. And, of course, the heads, the, the, you know, they, they, they've hit the uh, SBU headquarters in, in Kiev. So, you know, the, 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 there's, a, there's still an escalation ladder here, which the Russians aren't going up. Are you any idea how big the Russian Black Sea Fleet is? Well, I don't know the exact details. It's their. It's biggest. around forty-five ships. Yeah, all, all warships. Uh, now we, we've had is the total so far is fourteen of those have been destroyed, uh, and uh, fifteen of them are damaged. So uh, as uh, uh, as these. Um, uh, news websites do they have these horrid headlines where they're not talking about the number that have been destroyed they're still saying the russian black sea fleet is shrinking but it's still dangerous there are still 30 ships active well i mean uh, tony radkin who's the head of the british armed forces is an admiral he's head of the royal navy as well he's staying on for another year so that he can coordinate with the ukrainians and of course these storm shadow missiles which are sinking these ships are being, they're being fired by British personnel, as Schultz, uh, you know, the German Chancellor, letter, uh, you know, uh, you, you saw that the the intercept between the German 
generals talking about using tourist missiles to hit the Kerch Bridge. And, uh, and Schultz was saying we, uh, in public, we're not going to have our tourist missiles in there because then German personnel would have to be firing them and we don't want to go down that road. But the generals are then over, you know, basically they, they, they got the, the Russians intercepted the phone call where they talk about how they can use tourist missiles, but they'd have to use German personnel. A lot of these high level NATO missiles that have been used in Ukraine are not being fired by Ukrainians because the Ukrainians don't know how to but, use I them. I mean, it, so in it, other it, words, I don't know. British military noticed. personnel are firing those missiles. Last week we had, I think it was on Tuesday, a Russian railway bridge blown up in Russia. Uh, and on the next day, it's a Russian warship sunk. Let's have a listen just to the report on the, sink the sinking of the warship. Ukraine says it's destroyed another Russian warship in the Black Sea. Now, a Ukrainian military spokesman said the patrol boat had previously been targeted but was blown up overnight by maritime drones in the Kirsch Strait near Crimea. The attack follows the launching of 22 Russian drones targeting the Ukrainian port of Odessa. Let's get more on this from Rob McBride, who's standing by for us in the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv. Um, about the uh, Russian Black Fleet, Sea Fleet, uh, that's on patrol, uh, what more do we know about the damage that the Ukrainian sea drones uh, are doing? Yeah, this uh, does seem to be another uh, claim success by Ukrainian forces against the Russian Navy and against the Black Sea Fleet in particular. Uh, this uh, patrol ship, it's been uh, identified as the Sergei Kortov. Uh, according to the Ukrainians, it was attacked in the early hours, still in darkness, when it was uh, located in the Kerch Strait, which is just to the eastern end of the Crimean Peninsula. According to uh, footage on Russian social media that uh, purport purportedly shows the attack, we see and hear machine gun fire, presumably coming from the warship as it's trying to fend off the drone or drones, followed by a large explosion. And uh, footage that's now been released by the Ukrainian intelligence seems to show the same attack again with a large explosion, but from the point of view, it seems of a camera on board uh, one of the drones in this um, uh, attack. Um, the Ukrainians have been making large advances in their drone technology in recent times. They've uh, been becoming more powerful, extending the range of hundreds of kilometers, which has meant that uh, the Russian Black Sea Fleet has had to limit its areas of operation uh, away from the western northern parts of the Black Sea, more to the more protected eastern parts, but still clearly within range of these developing drones. What's also worrying from a Russian perspective, this is one of its newest warships. It's fairly small, only a crew of 80, but it came into service only in 2022. And like other warships in the Black Sea, uh, new or old, it doesn't seem to have an answer to the these Ukrainian drones. Uh, yeah, so that's another Al Jazeera report on these uh, drone attacks they are. Obviously, uh, this is the main thing, and Britain is now sending another 10,000 of these. Well, I, think, I hope that people listening to this show who live in the British Isles realise that at some point the Russians are going to fight back. If British military personnel and weaponry is being used to sink uh, Russian ships which kill Russian sailors, then the Russians at some point are going to kill some British sailors, just to remind you that war is war. Now, if you want to get involved in that, off you go, uh, but you'll have to live with the consequences. And I think uh, lots of people in this country uh, s still believe that we can provoke the Russians in the way we have been over the last 10 years and that nothing will happen to us. Russia is not that far away. It's much nearer, much closer to us than our great friends, the United States. Uh, it's closer to us than Israel. And we think uh, that we can p provoke them and nothing will happen. One of the things that's happened, of course, is that we're no longer allowed to fish in the, Bering, the, the Barents Sea, which means that price of fish in this country, cod mainly, is going through the roof because British trawlers which have fished there since the 1950s aren't allowed to fish there anymore. And that's just a minor irritation compared to what will happen if the Russians really decide to give us a bloody nose for what, because of what we're doing to them. Uh, I mean, they, they do be prepared, seem to be prepared to suck it up. Uh, why, why is that so much? They're prepared to suck it up because they don't want to escalate unless they have to. I understand that the people running the Black Sea fleet, the, 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 the admirals, the two, two admirals have been removed and they're bringing a third guy in whose name I can't remember. I was reading about it this morning. It is difficult for the Russians because, of course, they could easily start shooting back I mean, the, the, at the, the British the, the and American Russians, ships, uh, ships in the straight in, in, away. They could easily they do could this. They could knock down the AWACS, which are which are which are creating all. You see that all of the, uh, the, the the Ukrainians are fighting entirely. They could knock down the, satellites. I think actually right. this is probably what they'll do: is they will go for things which don't actually kill people. 
Well, the, the, what they will do is they will find the way of showing the British, if you carry on doing this, accidents can happen. And the, they'll probably try and play it in such a way that they send a message to Tony Radkin uh, not to get involved in this, or it might be the worst for you, I don't know rather, than, rather than shouting from the rooftops If, if you've it. heard of Lithuanian Foreign Minister Gabrielis Landsbergist, uh, he's expressed concerns over the West's response to Russia's war in Ukraine, likening the current situation to the prelude of a significant event like Pearl Harbor during World War II. Uh, according to a report by, what is that? LRT, whoever they are, I suppose that's a... Lithuanian broadcasters, uh, Landsbergis believes that the West is yet to fully acknowledge the gravity of the Russian-Ukrainian conflict and its implications. Uh, he argues that most Western countries are downplaying the war as a regional issue. This perception, he suggests, is due to a fear of escalation and results in a lack of adequate support for Ukraine. He emphasised this approach is a significant political problem, hinting at the need for a wake-up call similar to the attack on Pearl Harbour in 1941. Well, we've had all of these... Um politicians in the west like macron saying that we're probably going to have to send our troops to the ukraine well, we know and actually, then various other countries saying no 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 we can't do that but the fact is nato troops are in uh, it's a, a, a figure i've said is there are ten thousand polish young men have already died in the ukraine fighting as volunteers in the ukrainian army now, and what about British special forces well, in there doing in there training well, yeah. and operating these storm shadow that's missiles? That's right, they have, and of course, uh, no, special, that's not really special forces, but yes. And of course, and so this, these are the people Rishi Sunak is talking about, uh, the forces in the UK, trying to tear us apart. They are the people directing our special forces to try and start World War Three with Russia. Well, I would agree with that, but of course, uh, unlike on Gaza, you've still got a consensus within the mainstream, within the Overton window in British politics, that the Ukrainian cause is just. Even if they're losing, it's a just cause. It isn't a just cause. The people in the East Ukraine are not Ukrainian. They think of themselves as Russians, they never identified as Ukrainians, and there's no particular reason why they should be forced into a Ukrainian state that they don't want to belong to. Let's Any more than Kosovans want to be part of Serbia, and we went to war about that. Let's leave the last word, because we are actually going to talk a little bit about the budget before we close again, uh, to Mike Prisoner. He's uh, around about 2005, he's a US soldier, who, who spoke out against the wars that were being conducted as part of the war on terror, particularly the attack on Iraq. So uh, Mike, Mike Prisoner now, that's P-R-Y-S-N-E-R, -E Mike Prisoner, Prisoner, maybe. Uh, and this is uh, the, I suppose, bear in mind the sacrifice, um, uh, m burning himself, basically, self-immolation uh, by Aaron um, Bushnell. Bushnell last week. So let's have a listen to, uh, I suppose, precursor to that. Um, and during the time of the Iraq war, Mike Prisoner. Susan Brothers, thanks everyone for being here. We're from the organization March Forward, and we're here to say to all those serving in the Army, in the Marines, in the Air Force, in the Navy, that you have the absolute right to refuse to take part in these criminal wars, and that's the right that all of you should exercise. You have no reason to go put your life on the line and kill and die for profit. We've been to Iraq. We've been to Afghanistan. And we know what these wars are really about. And we joined the military for many reasons. Because we need a college education. Because we need a job. Because we need health care. And then we joined the military. And they tell us that our enemies are poor people in caves in Afghanistan. Or poor people in the deserts of Iraq. But we've been to those countries. And we know that our enemies are not other poor people abroad. Our enemies are the people that laid us off from our jobs. That denied us health care. That make it impossible to get an education. Our enemies are not in the poorest countries on the planet, but right here in the richest one. Oh. Now these wars, the occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan alone are costing over $700 million every single day. This is a crime every single day while so many of us are hurting. Well, I think all of us here and the vast majority of people in this country would agree that we can spend $700 million a day better than bombing people that we have no reason to bomb. We can spend $700 million a day rebuilding those countries we've destroyed. We can spend $700 million a day caring for the veterans we get home when they get home. And then we can spend $700 million a day giving every single person 
health care, a college education, a job and a livelihood and a home. That's who we need to be spending our money on. But this government is not going to do that. They're not going to use the money in that way. They're not going to end the wars. And they're not going to do it because it's not our government. It's their government. It's the government of the rich. It's the government of Wall Street, of the oil giants, of the defense contractors. It's their government. And the only language that they understand is shutting down business as usual. And that's what we're doing here today. And we're going to continue to do until these wars are over. clear now that these wars are going to continue and expand and go into other countries. That is the trend. That is what we know, that there is perpetual war. And it's only going to stop if the people stand up and stop it. And that's what we're going to do, sisters and brothers. And a lot of people ask me, what do we do? Because we all know things are bad. We all see the atrocities on TV, we read about it, we experience it. People always ask, what do I do? Because we always want to know what to do. Do we vote? Do we support a politician? Uh, what, you know, do we join an organization? What do we do? Well, I'll tell you what we do. It's simple. We fight. We fight and we fight and we fight and we shut down our workplaces. We shut down our schools. We shut down the streets. We shut down business as usual. And we fight until we force the people in there to do what the people out here want. Because that's how we're going to get around and we're going to fight until there's not one more bomb drop, not one more bullet fired, not one more co a soldier coming home in a wheelchair, not one more family slaughtered, not one more day of U.S. imperialism. So let's fight to make that happen. We can do it today and then the days ahead. We have to fight to end these wars and create a better world, sisters and brothers. So join us in that fight. Thanks. A little round of applause for Mike Prisoner there, speaking at the time of the Iraq war. Um, but Martin, the uh, the fact is that uh, Palestine Action, people like that, are actually in this country doing this. They are closing down some of the factories, at least causing trouble for them. Yes, and there's all sorts of different things that people can do. Sometimes people do feel powerless because, you know, it seems like a juggernaut that nobody can stop. Everybody can do a little bit of something. Uh, it's, it's just a little bit of something, money and everybody into, does a little bit of something. Sh it'll, shoveling it'll, it'll money into the pockets of Ibrahim uh, Organi is a rather disappointing to hear that people who are try th trying to donate to get aid to Gaza are funding him. Well, uh, you should give, give your aid. If you, if, you, if you want to give aid, you've got to choose your organisations carefully, and you've got to also understand that some compromises will have to be made. I used to be an aid worker. And sometimes you have to make compromises to get the aid through. You, you, don't, you don't really have to. It seems it, to me much to, more sensible to, to, go with to take action here somehow in the UK. Well, yes, than... of course. And the other thing is that we shouldn't be needing to send aid to Palestine. It should be rebuilding itself as an independent state and, and sorting their own problems out. I mean, you're not there yet, You seem to be more of a fan of King Charles than I am. You think he's not quite so involved in all these things. But there has been a fantastic series, by the way, on Channel 4 Monday evening. Uh, called Investigating Diana. I think it's carrying on for another couple of weeks. It's a repeat from a couple of years ago, but it's one of the best documentaries I've seen. Uh, a lot of it focusing on the French side of the investigation. And obviously, the French were a little bit less controlled about the way they saw it all uh, than the British establishment over here. Mohammed wanted as many investigations as he could get because he, did, he wanted the answers and he wanted as many different people to be asking the questions as possible uh, because that is the way you get to the truth. The turning point was when Richard Tomlinson, former MI6 spy, turns up in Paris to tell the French inquiry that he has seen the plans for an assassination plot when he was at MI6 in a tunnel, using motorcyclists and bright lights and so on. Mohammed came rushing into the office and he said to me, you know, God has answered my prayers. Uh, you know, here is a man telling the story that I, this is what I think happened. When the accident first happened, um, it didn't really occur to me that it was in any way related, but it what made me realize very, very strongly was that the witness report, there was a very bright light. 
in a tunnel. And as soon as I heard that, that made me click two and two things together. But the, the combination of the bright light and the tunnel was made me think straight away, well, maybe it wasn't an accident. Mohammed was ecstatic. And I have to say, I shared his joy because it all sounded to me uh, so totally credible. So that's the series on Channel 4 at the moment, repeated from 2022, uh, investigating Diana, don't miss it, <laughs> on a Monday evening. Martin, the point here is, if King Charles is prepared to be involved in the death of Diana, his wife, uh, then uh, he's not. He's going to think that uh, other deaths in other parts of the world are just kind of normal, isn't he? Well, even if Diana was assassinated, it doesn't necessarily mean that he was directly involved, I'll make that point. And I'm, I, I believe she was assassinated, but I don't think he was necessarily directly involved. Uh, and of course, he's, he is who he is. He's got connect, I mean, he's, he's obviously been uh, very, what very. Mean, what do you mean by that? He, he is who he, he is. He is very pro Israeli, for example. We know he is. He was a friend of well, Jonathan well, Sachs. He's, 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 con you know, he's not spoken out of it. He's not in Gaza, let's, let's although his son more simply. has. Let's his put son it, has. Let's put it more simply. Uh, he's, uh, an outspoken, a, a sort of medieval-style king, that he's not interested in the idea of taking a step back from it all and allowing uh, the elected politicians to get on with it and only intervening where necessary. He's got a very, very clear vision of where he wants the country to go, and he's quite clearly in favour uh, of... Uh, I mean, in fact, in, in, in the Queen's speech, or the King's speech that he gave last year, he immediately talked about uh, Hamas as a terrorist organisation. That's government policy. That's a, that's a fundamental. He didn't have to do that, did he? No, he did because it's in the Queen's. He it's in the King's speech. It. It's written so by Rishi Sunak. So, he, so Rishi Sunak writes that. You think? No, it, 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 it only Hamas only became a terrorist organisation and a banned organisation in this country relatively recently, and in actual fact, that's a fundamental problem because Hamas are the elected government of Palestine, and in in the in the in the in Syria they were fighting in, alongside the Free Syrian Army, who were also trained by our special forces against the Syrian Arab Army, and when they were fighting against the Syrian army, they were heroes and uh, war-fighting freedom fighters. But now they're fighting their, Isra their traditional Israeli enemies, they are terrorists. Well, let's have but a it's exactly the same people. Let's have a listen and go over the other side of the Atlantic, look at the guy who's supposed to be in charge the other side. Well, Rishi Sunak's supposed to be in charge here. Yeah. Uh, my, my view is that uh, people around King Charles are far more powerful than making so many of these appointments. Uh, but but uh, over in the States, we've had a bit of a mess-up by Joe Biden. Uh, here he is. Have a listen to what he says here about uh, trying to get aid into Gaza. The loss of life is heartbreaking. People are so desperate that uh, uh, innocent people got caught in a terrible war, unable to feed their families, and you saw the response when they tried to get aid in. And we need to do more, and the United States will do more. In the coming days, we're going to join with our friends in Jordan and others in providing airdrops of, of uh, additional food and supplies into Ukraine and seek to continue to open up other avenues into Ukraine, including the possibility of a marine corridor to deliver large amounts of uh, humanitarian assistance. In addition to expanding deliveries by land, uh, as I said, we're going we're to insist that Israel facilitate more trucks and more routes to get more and more people the, the help they need. No excuses, because the truth is, aid flowing to Gaza is nowhere nearly enough now it's nowhere nearly enough so there he is uh twice mistaking gaza for ukraine and actually saying the words the jordanians are going to help us get aid into ukraine yeah well that just shows that, that uh, his cognitive difficulties trump can string a sentence together but he's a hundred percent behind the right wing in israel a hundred percent so if he takes over in November, it will be January by the time he takes over, there is nothing well, I to think hope it, for well, there. What I think it illustrates nothing is that all. actually Biden is not in charge of anything. No, uh, not even, Trump, not Trump even, won't not be in not charge his own, Not even his own mouth. Uh, so uh, he, gave, he gave last night the State of the Union address. Uh, so here are some key moments, or well, I suppose this is what they're called key moments, from that uh, State of the Union address uh, in front of uh, Congress, I believe. I'm not sure if it's both houses in the States, but it's a political speech by the President in front of the elected uh, Senators. Good evening. If I were smart, I'd go home now. 
I say this to Congress. We have to stand up to Putin. Send me a bipartisan national security bill. History is literally watching. History is watching. If the United States walks away, it will put Ukraine at risk. Europe is at risk. The free world will be at risk, emboldening others to do what they wish to do us harm. My message to President Putin, who I've known for a long time, is simple. We will not walk away. We will not bow down. I will not bow down. In a literal sense, history is watching. History is watching. Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. But how many of the thousands of people being killed by legals? To her parents, I say, my heart goes out to you, having lost children myself. I understand. I know it may not look like it, but I've been around a while. <laughs> when you get to be my age, certain things become clearer than ever. I know the American story. Again and again, I've seen the contest between competing forces and the battle for the soul of our nation. Between those who want to pull America back to the past and those who want to move America into the future. My lifetime has taught me to embrace freedom and democracy, a future based on core values that have defined America, honesty, decency, dignity, equality, to respect everyone, to give everyone a fair shot, to give hate no safe harbor. Now, other people my age see it differently. It's the American story of resentment, revenge, and retribution, that's not me. And Israel must do its part. Israel must allow more aid into Gaza to ensure humanitarian workers aren't caught in the crossfire. And they're announcing they're going to they're going to call, have a crossing in northern Gaza. To the leadership of Israel, I say this. Humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip. Protecting and saving innocent lives has to be a priority. Now, so far as I know, um, there aren't any aid workers caught in the crossfire. They've been being killed by Israel, not by... Well, that's right. So the, there's a level of hypocrisy developing now where... The West is trying, uh, you know, Cameron, Biden, they're trying to sort of wriggle out of the responsibility for what's happened and try to suggest that they do really, really, really care about Palestinian children who are dying and being starved. Uh, but it's pretty pathetic if you think about what, what they've, you know, there's still, there, there are still planes flying from Akrotiri in Cyprus, a British base, which nobody in Cyprus wants to be there. It's there because we made them have it. And uh, we're using that base to supply weaponry to the Israelis to carry on killing but, but children look, at the same time as weeping crocodile tears. Let's get back to Biden, though. Uh, I mean, he's saying, uh, I will not bow down. We were joking, I will not fall over. Uh, so, uh, but but um, the point is, he's saying, no, sa uh, ha we will give hate no safe harbour. But he's trying to start World War Three. I mean, these people are, um, you know, they're, they're talking out of both sides of their mouth at the same time, aren't they? And this is one of the major problems and the one that's causing so many so much division is the fact that they're saying one thing and doing the opposite all the time well that's right i mean the, 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 you know they are they are criminals and hypocrites uh and of course this is widely becoming understood uh, around the world i mean all of the bullying that went on over what was happening in ukraine you know everybody's got to put sanctions on russia etc although nobody did apart from the american vassals in western europe australia and new zealand nobody else put, put any sanctions on because they couldn't see that it was justified but at the same time then, then they turn around and and the, we see what's happening in gaza and not only the americans not intervening and they could easily intervene they could just pick but biden if he was a different kind of president uh, like jfk for example could pick up the phone and say you've got to stop doing that right now or we're going to cut off your your your, your pocket money we're going to ground you and they'd have to stop 
but he's not doing it is he no and i think actually a similar message could come from the uk but anyway like we uh a penultimate section we're going to look at the budget again now back to we had a little brief chat about it but i did speak earlier this week to the workers party's chris williamson about what sort of budget he would like to have presented uh rather than jeremy hunt uh so chris williamson is a former uh labor mp uh who was actually removed by jeremy corbyn you know there's that famous article that jeremy corbyn treated his enemies better than his friends well chris williamson was a friend of his uh very much pro palestine pro gaza uh, and corbyn presided over him being removed from the labor party so here's chris and the workers party galloway's party's take on the budget 2024 i'll be announcing a plan to eliminate poverty in the lifetime of a, of a parliament although we're nearly at the end of this parliament but certainly that's something i think that we could be doing so i think there would be a big excuse me for me a big increase in the social security uh, uh budget in order to uh, alleviate the, you know, the, 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 the grotesque levels of poverty that we have uh, in this, uh, in this uh, country. I would also be announcing a big um, uh, public housing drive to, to address the, uh, the housing crisis that we uh, have uh, in the country, you know, people sleeping rough and uh, people living in, in insanitary uh, uh, accommodation and so on. I'd also be announcing a big increase in the, in the minimum wage as well to, Go in, go alongside the the big increase in in social uh, security payments. I think they would be the kind of things that would make a huge difference to people. And if you wanted me to go on, I would be you know bringing in measures to uh, restrict the ability of the utilities to charge the fees that they do, and also start set in train the process to bring these uh, bring these uh, utilities and rail industry etc. back into public uh, ownership. Essentially, what we need to do is put the, you know, put the state at the at, at the center of creating a a good society. The states have enormous powers at their disposal, uh, and particularly in Britain because of our uh, you know, status as a, a currency issue in nation. Unlike in Europe, of course, where they've gone into the eurozone, and so in essentially what. Um, the nations of the uh, that are in the eurozone in the in the European Union, they've been relegated to the status of a local authority, where they're not in control of their own destiny, you know, and because uh, they uh, can't issue their own currency anymore. Uh, and that was one good thing that Gordon Brown did when he kept us out of the uh, out of the euro. So, but I think that would be my the, my three sort of top priorities. But there's so much wrong with the country, God, you know, you could go on all night. <laughs> So that's Chris Williamson there talking to me earlier this week. There's a longer version of that. I'll be up on our show page at thisweek.org.uk. So running through his little, it's the uh, uh, money on uh, social services, that is to say um, the welfare payments, More, much more money going, going to that. Uh, also money going to uh, the uh, Wait, minimum up on the minimum wage and also public housing martin so social security public housing minimum wage that's his three main things yeah well obviously the minimum wage doesn't necessarily cost the government any money they can decide to raise the minimum wage and it's the the bosses who have to pay it um well i mean i've got nothing to disagree with there and i think he's right that by having not being in the euro britain does have more flexibility than it would otherwise have but you'll also find that we wouldn't be allowed to do that if we tried to do it, then the, the then then lots of forces would immediately gang up on us. Are you talking about like they do a Liz Truss on us? Well, the, the, what they did to Liz well, Truss. No, Liz Truss did. Are you talking about the city of London? No, I'm, what not to, forces? I'm not just talking about the city of London. I'm talking about the. the I mean, what forces are you talking well, about? Well, it, 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 for example, there was a, a, an anonymous general who said when Jeremy Corbyn was the leader of the Labour Party, we will not allow him to come do to you power. Think there might be a coup. If, if, if you try if to Chris do Williamson, something like that, there might well if be. If Chris could. Williamson and his party uh, managed to get a, amazingly a majority, uh, and they were presenting their budget, and they said they were going to have uh, uh, social security, more money for that, more money for public housing, and, um, and a minute and upping the minimum wage, uh, that uh, that there would be a coup. Well, it might be. I'm just saying. They don't presume that you can just do what you want, because you can't. Well, you'd have to include some increase in the military wages as well, then you might well, not have no, a no, the, you, you wouldn't necessarily... It's not a question of the ordinary grunts in the army deciding they don't like the government. It's the, it's the high-ups who are in constant communication with our American overlords. OK, well, uh, Steve Hall, who we spoke to last week, also asked him about the budget. First of all, we should be talking about massive 
public investment in productivity, levering ourselves onto the cutting edge of the new green. Some people are calling it the fourth industrial revolution. We need clean energy. There's a debate about whether it should be nuclear, whether it should be borium reactors or uranium reactors, wind power, some of the, the um, vestiges of fossil fuel that we might need to, to cope with the problems of nuclear power throttling up and throttling down. All of these things need to be talked about, discussed seriously start with energy start with rail start with infrastructure start with business startups all of these things need to be funded by government we could even in the interim offer a job guarantee as some of the heterodox uh, economists um, suggest there are so many things we could do and we need absolutely massive public investment and we don't have to borrow for this public investment it was it's not about borrowing bonds aren't are about borrowing bond money where does it go it goes in the, it goes into savings accounts when we paid back later with, with interest but so for in 30 40 years time we don't use that money that's simply to to set overnight interest rates to give the government some control of interest rates all of the money we we, we invest it, it actually is comes from a consolidated fund now, this is dismissed as money printing, which is a sort of demonic term, as if that's going to cause massive inflation. Well, it didn't after World War Two. It did. It's not in the United States of America at the moment. They're growing the economy and it's not inflating. Inflation, of course, as we know, is caused by price rises and supply shortages during the COVID um, incident. And, and, you know, most inflation is cost push. It seems to me that that is going to be driving inflation up. Uh, by putting interest rates up, not down, and and we were being told the opposite, which eventually is what it what it does. And it makes mortgages more expensive, makes rents more expensive, it makes borrowing. I mean, all businesses are running on credit all the time; they're borrowing just to keep going. There's also a huge consumer credit, and don't forget, there's this huge disconnect between the base rate and the amount of money. Uh, the amount of interest charged by banks, the credit card companies. I mean, that, that's a market. That's a market outside of the base rate. And, that's, and, and they're operating a cartel. Those those borrowing rates could be far cheaper, but they operate a cartel to make sure those, those, those rates. And you get ridiculous, you know, things like the Prudential way of paying 40 percent APR. It's 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 crazy. What we, what we need, of course, uh, at a lower interest rates, uh, it's, I would operate a zero interest rate policy at the central bank, which means you don't need bonds to sell to set the overnight interest rate. And I would make that the baseline. Uh, and the market has to compete at a much lower level, which would bring down the costs of borrowing. Bring down the costs of borrowing, mortgages are cheaper, it gives people more disposable income, therefore aggregate demand goes up. And therefore, if, if, we invest in production to meet that demand, we won't cause inflation. But if we don't, if we don't do that, then we will get inflation. So it's all about productivity. It's about investment. It's again about bringing the economy back to health. There are ways to do this. But one thing and one thing gets in the way, and that is that the private investors who are connected to mass media, who have got politicians in their pockets, don't want public investment to crowd out their private investment. They're against public investment because it's taking their business away from them. I rather like the way Steve Hall explains this stuff so clearly. What do you make of what he's saying there, though, Martin? Well, I mean, I would, I would broadly agree with that. But when he's referring to crowding out investment, when I was studying economics many years ago, the, the, the theory was that if you have too much public investment, it crowds out the private sector. And this is a bad thing because ultimately it's very inefficient and the private sector is more efficient. Now, this is simply wrong, and I'm sure he would agree with me if, we, if he was here on the studio, uh, because in actual fact, public investment actually makes private investment profitable. Yeah, that's why Britain, the, 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 you know, the, from 1945 to the mid 1970s, uh, Western European and, and, and U.S. capitalism worked rather well. Is because there was quite there was no there was no nonsense about not well, having we, a public what sector. Get, what we get again and again from people like Rachel Reeves, and by the way, it was weird to see that it was Keir Starmer that responded to Jeremy Hunt on Wednesday at, on Budget Day. Uh, I was expecting to see Rachel Reeves pop up, but no. Apparently, they've decided that Keir Starmer is the right public relations person to do it but surely it should be the shadow chancellor that responds to the chancellor not uh, the uh, um, uh, leader of the labor party anyway uh, one of the things that um, 
uh steve talks about there is this whole idea of it's not really like as rachel reeves always says oh it's just like you know i was i learned about money around the, t- the table with my mum borrowing and using money on the credit card and this sort of thing uh apparently it's nothing like that martin is it and that banks no, can isn't. just make up money out of no, nowhere it isn't. i was quite annoyed with rachel reeves for using that metaphor and yanis varoufakis uh wrote an article in the guardian mocking her really because it just shows i mean what she's doing she's she used to work for the bank of england she's quite intelligent she should know that in actual fact we've got to knock this on the head the idea that there is no money there is a massive amount of magic money trees out there the question is what are you going to spend the magic money tree money on and of course what we do with our magic money tree money is we subsidize war we subsidize all the things that we we shouldn't be subsidizing but the idea that that you can't you know if you you could raise taxes on the wealthy that's perfectly feasible if you wanted to uh, but you can also just print the money and if you get a bit of inflation as a result of that that actually takes the money off the wealthy without them being able to do anything much about uh, anyway, it was which quite... is why they hated the the successful era of capitalism because In the, version... the inflation actually took t- took the nest eggs away from the people who got nest eggs in the longer version of that interview um with steve hall there uh, he talks a bit about ben bernanke and who how he actually confesses and he says it uh, and so I dug out that clip, um, and so here's Bernanke, uh, the head of the Federal Reserve, uh, talking about um, uh, in when they want to lend money to a bank, they simply use a computer to mark up the size of the bank account. There's absolutely no uh, debt or whatever. Hang on, I suppose it is debt, but it's not. That's the problem. It's, this is, uh, this is a, 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 just clicking a button on a computer. You're making this money up out of nowhere. Is that tax money that the Fed is spending? It's not tax money. The banks have... Um, accounts with the Fed much the same way that you have an account in a commercial bank. So to lend to a bank, we simply use the computer to mark up the uh, size of the account that they have with the Fed. So it's much more akin, uh, although not exactly the same, but it's much more akin to printing money than it is to borrowing. So then there's Ben Bernanke spelling it out like it is. He's saying basically it's just the press of a button uh, creating millions of dollars for a bank that then lends the, the our interest. Yeah, well, in actual fact, what we've done is by div- by design, we've dis- we've given over the creation of money to the private bankers. But there's no reason for that. We've just the private bankers are very politically powerful, and they have you know that's what you know the Federal Reserve is run by them and gives them free money, which they then lend on to others as a, as a profit. Uh, and also, of course, they, they then decide what things they want and what things they C- don't want. I know it's a, a bit of a cheeky question, but if, could I ask you what you would do if you had uh, the job of Jeremy Hunt? We, we, I mean, we, we got some interesting bits and bobs there, particularly really useful from Chris Williamson giving us his three main things, including, of course, uh, starting the process of moving these utilities back into public ownership. But uh, what would you do? Well, I, w- I'm, I wouldn't disagree with the general direction of travel that, that they are pr- proposing. I would suggest, though, that the problem you're going to have, if you, uh, we should be telling people we need massive public investment. People, people rev- eventually will f- f- face up to the fact that that is the only way to get out of a major capitalist crisis, is public investment. Now, you've got to then say, well, where's that coming from? You say, well, we're going to have to raise taxes on wealthy people. Things like land taxes, uh, you know, property taxes. Property taxes are very good to collect because a piece of property can't run away. And uh, you, you could also say to people, they've abolished non-DOM status. You know what they'll do? What they'll do is they will take that property and they'll sell it and then they'll put the money abroad that you can't yeah, get well, your hands okay. on. Yeah, well, OK, I was just going to say, in the budget, as a way of stealing Labour's clothes, Jeremy Hunt has abolished, is going to abolish non-DOM status. Like Rishi Sunak's wife, who's a billionaire, didn't have to pay any tax in this country because, in theory, she lives in India. So, but you could, you could easily tighten that up. And you could also say to other wealthy people, we think you owe so much tax. And you say you don't, you say you live in Belize. I would say to these people, uh, like uh, the former chair of the Conservative Party, uh, you will live in Belize because we're going to take your well, citizenship. Well, I asked off Chris the awkward yeah, question hardball. about how you get money off of wealthy people who've got squirreled it away abroad. Did you know what he said? I said, who? Right. Do you know what he said? Have a guess. Who, who are we talking about? Chris now? Williamson. I asked him about how do you get money off of people who've squirrelled it away abroad, and well, he said, "Well, you have a look at where these places are. They're mostly controlled by the British Crown. They are indeed. 
And so it's a quite straightforward thing for Britain to do. You have to, to have a word with King Charles. Yes, I know, but what would happen if the British government decided to, to tighten up on all these, uh, uh, you know, British dependencies is that the dirty money would flow to other places. But what you can easily do, and it's quite straightforward, is you could change the taxation system so instead of having a profits tax, you have a turnover tax. So somebody like Google has got massive industry, mass, massive amount of money going through the British. You say, well, we think you owe that much money. You say that you've only got a certain amount of profit and you've shown it all in Dublin. We think you've got a lot more profit. And the government could have civil yeah. servants assessing how much turnover they've got. And, the, and then you charge them and they, say, and they could argue back and they say, no, we think you owe this much. That's what you do with companies. With individuals, it's even more straightforward. You say, if you say you do not live in Britain and therefore you don't have to pay the tax, then you will not live in Britain. Now, you, if you go, you go, but you won't come back. Yeah, anyway, and any property that you have in Britain, we will seize it. One just as all of Russia's thing, uh, uh, foreign reserves have just been seized. Just like that. Bang! $300 billion. One thing's for sure. Yes, that's you can right. Do stuff they like they that. want to transfer it to Ukraine as well. well indeed, anyway, but it just shows that it can be done if you want to do it. Especially if we're all going to war, which they keep going on about, out of the other side of their mouth. You know... They want to say that they want to say, well, we're going to have a much more prosperous future with more more millionaires, more billionaires, more entrepreneurs, but also we're also going to have a war, which will involve sacrifice. Okay, we've got a couple more items before we finish. One is uh, look at Rudolf Hess and that flight, an interview I did this week with John Harris, the author, uh, and finally a bit about uh, Jerusalem. Is it the idea to make it the capital of a one world? government but uh but as we're finishing with the finance uh patrizia opulenza this week has an ode punch crunch drunk judy the budget on hunt's red case queen's face did see working through the night said he a photo op in darkened room hunt lit up all bathed in gloom proud as punch hunt then did trip through the budget what a clip Crumbs he threw to save the bacon, already burnt, our lives forsaken. Perhaps increase of tax could add to capital gains. An idea, not bad. VAT reduced. Tis now high time. Why is this seen by Hunt as a crime? A soup of words, Hunt punched his way, wild staring eyes to have his say. Rishi next to Powell did sit. Smirking broadly, he's done his bit. Destroy our country from inside out, unelected a weffy snout. Smarma, satin, greasy suit, hair like glue, red nose to boot. A snifter smarma, perhaps air taken. Medicinal to stop from quaken. Disdain on face when budget heard, crunching numbers quite absurd. R. Reeves in corner, perhaps told sit, while smarmy starma says his bit. <laughs> Starmer's voice like zippy sounds, bleating on, no truth e'er found, Reeves in suit like Undertaker, a voice so dull, another faker. Money funnelled out for war, no mention of this cut we saw. Pre-convid, and the years since then, our wealth all stolen. Tis us and them, a soup of words on the budget railed, empty sounds from mouths exhaled, between each cheek of reds and blues, bruising folks, punch bags, abuse, laughing loud, all up their sleeves, a coup d'etat, GB, to knees. Through troubled waters, no matter now, the globalists our land hath ploughed, reeves and starmer in a stew, no compromise, tis clearly true, smarmer, drunk, on power, tis clear, the Labour Party, no longer steer. A farce played out in Westminster Sea, bludgeoned lives don't hide their glee, coffers emptied, says no surprise, stripped our land, now privatised. No matter how, who stands in power, lies deceit on us, will shower. Two sides, same coin, cheap silver plated, GB our land, through sieve, has grated, carved it up the spoils of dust, GB, come hell, or high water, is bust. Thank you very much, Patricia uh, Opulenza. Martin, before we hear the clip about uh, Rudolf Hess this week, uh, what do you make of that trip that he made in 1941, just before the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union? Well, uh, he flew he, to Britain. He, he claimed he claimed to be, you know, the, the, the you know the official record is that he he came to Britain to negotiate a potential uh, entente between the German. Uh, regime and the British so that they could, you know, so that they could, you know, th th there was no reason for the British Empire and the Germans to fight. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with the Russians for you, we'll deal with the Soviets for you. What about it? 
Uh, and of course, you know, it, it didn't go anywhere. Do you think it was, it was ever going to be a coup here or some sort of change in policy if Hess arrived? Well, I, I think what happened was there was a big fight within the British establishment about what the policy towards Hitler was going to be. And don't forget, as you, we know, the Pinay Circle and so on, lots of people are very deep into the establishment were quite keen on Hitler and didn't regard him as a threat to Britain at all. But this is, even, to, I mean, even, this is even after May, 1940. This is May 1941, yeah. after the Blitz had begun and was happening yeah. every day, pretty much, or every night. And um, this was we were well into the war by this stage. Yes, but of course the possibility of stopping a war, even when you're well into it, is always there. It's there in the Ukraine and it's there in, in Palestine. I mean, my own but are we going to? The answer is probably not. OK, well, I'll tell you my own view uh, after we've heard from John Harris. We believe he was heading for RAF Dundonald, which is a controversial statement because it was an operational RAF base just beneath Glasgow. Why do we think RAF Donald, uh, Dundonald? Well, number of reasons. Number one, um, it's marked by inference on the flight map that Hess brought with him. Number two, it was a quiet RAF base. It had just recently um, been emptied of um, navigational students. So on that Saturday, there weren't many people about. And thirdly, it was under the direct operational command, again, of the Duke of Hamilton. So that's why we believe uh, Dundonald was the um, intended target. But as far as Rudolf Hess was concerned, the BF-110 was a huge plane. Uh, it was twin-engined. Uh, in my farming career, I've got, a, I've got some tractors which are typically about 100 horsepower each, and they're quite substantial machines. Um, the, the Hess plane had 2,000 horsepower engines, 10 times uh, the size of my tractor engine. So they were pretty, that was pretty huge, and they were supping fuel at the rate of around 660 litres per hour. So that's where the timings come in uh, to importance, because... He took off at 5.45, crashed at 7 minutes past 11. That's roughly 5 hours, 24 minutes. And a Messerschmitt 110 held just short of 1,300 litres of fuel in its tanks. And so consequently, it could only typically fly for around about two hours. So there's been a lot of speculation in the past that, oh, well, it couldn't have been the Hess plane because he couldn't have carried enough fuel. Ostensibly, that is, of course, the case. But what Hess had got, in addition to the, the fuel tanks in the wing, was um, twin auxiliary fuel tanks. And the Luftwaffe supplied those in, um, in um, 900 litre sizes. There's quite a lot of of evidence to support the fact that Hess had got two 900 litre uh, fuel tanks. That meant that he'd got circa 3,000 litres of fuel on board when he took off. So as far as fuel was concerned, he hadn't got a problem. He'd got sufficient fuel to make the flight that we know uh, took place. However, where life gets somewhat more interesting is that the Messerschmitt 110 had two huge Daimler Benz 601 engines, as I've said, and they were of a dry sump uh, design, which meant that oil was actually utilised, not recycled. So it would use oil at a rate of between seven and nine litres per hour. And behind each of these huge engines were a 35 litre oil tank. So simple mathematics means that if, if the engines were, being, uh, were using oil at nine litres per hour, then the plane could only fly for four hours, which we know uh, it supposedly uh, flew for five hours, 24 minutes. So it's the oil which is the interesting issue. And the Luftwaffe obviously had thought of that too. So it also had an auxiliary oil tank um, option that could be fitted. And the 
the radio operator in the in the plane would pump the oil through to the engine tank from the auxiliary tank. Unfortunately, in the Hess affair, there was no um, radio operator, so consequently, there was nobody to uh, pump any oil. And the, in the fuselage, which still resides at Duxford to this day, um, there is no auxiliary oil tank either. Uh, instead, there's a big brass nut that is wired in place. So Hess certainly did not have an auxiliary oil tank. And that then, th this is quite old information. We, we've probably discussed this before, Tony. Because there was no auxiliary oil tank fitted, Hess could not have flown for five hours, 24 minutes without his engine seizing through loss of oil. And it's that basic fact that has driven us to do more work. And we now are absolutely convinced that he landed en route at a place called Gießen in northern Germany, refueled and re-oiled, and that then enabled him to take off again with sufficient fuel and oil to land and fly as he did to, um, to Lowland Scotland. From Gießen, he flew up the North Sea at an angle of 335 degrees. How do we know that? That's on a map that um, the ploughman that arrested him on, um, uh, on, on landing tore from his knee. And that was a navigational chart that we were sent a copy of years ago. And then the issue becomes when to turn left, as you quite rightly say, between um, the Edinburgh air defences and the Newcastle air defences. And it's at that point that think the flight began to unravel. Um, when Hess wrote years later to his wife, who lived in Bavaria after the war, from his prison cell in Spandau in Berlin, he bemoaned the fact that at the decisive moment, as he called it, i.e. went to turn left, his radio compass failed him. And we take that to mean that he lost contact with the radio navigation system. And so consequently, he didn't know for sure when to turn left. Yeah, well, that's a little bit awkward, isn't it? Imagine you're flying up in the in the evening uh, up the North Sea, right up the middle of the North Sea, and you've got to turn left to land in Scotland, and then all of a sudden uh, your radio navigation equipment goes blank. So maybe the Germans had switched off the towers. Uh, maybe that's because they weren't doing a raid that night, but maybe it's because they knew exactly where Hess was and they were trying to cause trouble for him. So anyway, that we do discuss that in the longer interview. I'll probably have another clip from that next week, uh, but the two books uh, that uh, that John has just brought out are one is Conspiracy, Calamity and Cover-Up, uh, John Harris, uh, about the Hess flight, and the other one is called the Rudolf Hess Flight Book, which looks at the various na radio navigation aids uh, that Hess was using. But the point really here is, and John and I disagree about this, but we have very polite conversations about it, about whether or not there really was any chance of Hess uh, in being involved in some kind of armistice between Nazi Germany and Britain in May 1941. Uh, this, uh, it looks to me, was a very clever ruse by MI6, uh, and we, we do talk about this in the longer interview, uh, and Tancred Berenius, who was the uh, for the uh, Nazi ambassador, or not, sorry, he was a Finnish ambassador to Nazi Germany, and also in touch with MI6, persuading Hess that there was a real chance of all this happening, and that there was a big faction in Britain that was against Churchill, and that all he needed to do was come over, and uh, everything would be wonderful. But there's another motive here for MI6, is they were one by one, including uh, later on in the war, uh, Reinhard Heydrich. What they were doing was making sure that the people who'd been friends with Hitler, and Hitler uh, saw or Heydrich, for example, as his successor, uh, that these people were either murdered or gotten it spun out of the way from Hitler's inner circle by MI6 in different fashions, this just being uh, Hess just being one of them, in order to leave Martin Bormann as the most influential Nazi very close uh, to uh, Adolf Hitler in the last years 
uh, of the Second World War. So uh, anyway, uh, I'll put the full interview with John Harris up on our show page about the Hess flight and his new books on that topic at thisweek.org.uk. And we finish this week uh, with David Sorensen, who's brought out a film. He's, he does a website, um, or he's part of a website called Stop World Control. Uh, and this is a, a film just out, literally the last few weeks, about the what he calls the Zionist plan uh, to uh, create a one world government based in Jerusalem. So this is the mystery of Israel that has been solved. It, it has nothing to do with what the ancient scriptures say about what Israel is. It is diametrically the opposite of that. It was founded and financed by blatant Satanists who have an agenda for world domination and who want to have the support of the billions of Christians from around the world so that they can succeed in their agenda. I understand that it's extremely shocking if you hear this for the first time. But all this information can be researched. You can find more and more evidence for this when you do your due diligence. I want to invite you to become part of building a better world where we don't support entities that create war and murder hundreds of thousands and even millions of people. We are not here to make this world a place of horror and terror and fear and destruction. We are here to bring love, justice and goodness amongst all of humanity. This is our purpose. That's why this film was made, to expose an extremely nefarious agenda. Their plan is to incite world war, so that they can use that as an excuse for establishing a one world government, which would then supposedly bring peace. We have the choice to fall into this trap, or to open our eyes, and have the courage to stand up for what is right, and prevent their agenda. So that is uh, the well, his name anyway is David Sorensen. It's stopworldcontrol.com is where he resides, and that's certainly his view is that uh, the idea is that Jerusalem will keep going, uh, and that the plan is to make that the center of a world government. And the idea, of course, is auto abkeo, create massive amounts of chaos, a third world war, um, and to bring peace based in Jerusalem, out of it all. Well, this almost seems to be a kind of upside-down version of God's plan uh, for mankind, but that's what you'd expect, I suppose, from these accelerationists and Armageddonists, isn't it? Uh, so time to sign off now. Thanks very much to our guests, Irish Republican Labour activist Martin Summers, uh, Bristol's Green Councillor for Central Ward, Annie Stafford Townsend, also calls to Judith Brown, uh, for or Dr. Judith Brown, uh, who's a Yemen expert and a, a fact checker and just about to start her uh, information control s- uh, substack, uh, as well, of course, as Bristol's freelance or Bristol freelance journalist, Joe Banks, uh, and to sound engineer Dave Bazanko, and particularly also, of course, to Patrizia Opulenza, our poet, uh, resident poet. Uh, you can download our MP3s to listen in the car or anywhere you like. Follow Tony Gosling Censored on Telegram. Do please share their interviews and story tips, and uh, you can always get a sort of main um, direction on any of these things from uh, the Not the BCFM Politics show page. You'll find there the podcast, the full-length interviews, uh, which you can use also very easily access on the app, uh, Not the BCFM Politics show app, and uh, story links, the comment page, and our email addresses. You can also subscribe to my weekly newsletter there, and you can even donate at thisweekoneword.org. Dot UK. Uh, my paperbacks are available. That's the Traders of Arnhem, Martin Borman and the Bilderbergers, uh, and also the Siege of Heaven Reader. They're both via www.bilderberg.org. This show is repeated at 11 p.m. Fridays and 11 and 5 a.m. and p.m. all week on the PRSC stream. That is uh, here at talkradio.org.uk. Uh, and also Sunday breakfast at Cambridge Radio Q UK. Dot com. We've been streaming live from the People's Republic of Stokescroft in Bristol on the talkradio.org.uk stream and the radioquk.com and Camberley, Surrey and live 
on the Not The BCFM Politics Show app. If you can restream us live or rebroadcast us, just let me know and I'll credit you here. Have a relaxing and enjoyable weekend. Do please join us for Not The BCFM Politics Show next Friday at 5. God bless. And don't let the satanic banksters get you down. Make me smile when I'm feeling down. You give me such a vibe, I still leave on a fire. It's not the way you walk, and it ain't the way you talk. It ain't the job you got that keeps me satisfied. You love me so.
you, mister It's only I got what it takes She said I'll turn you on Son into something strong Play the song with the foggy break And go kart Mozart Was checking out the weather charts To see if it was safe outside And little early birdie Gave my inner girl a whirly And asked me if I needed a She never got touch, she's gonna make it to the night She's gonna make it through
got down But you never got touch It's gonna make it Through